honest. Okay, uh, if everybody could please take your seats um, and quiet down. We're going to go ahead and start this, um, and I'm going to call to order this meeting of the 6th of April, 2023, City of Nashua Planning Board. Um, can we get a roll call, please? Yes, Mr. Chair. Mayor Donges, Mike Peterson, Scott LeClaire. Here. Adam Varley. Here. Maggie Harper. Here. Alderman Clee. Dan Hudson. Here. Bob Bollinger. Larry Hirsch. Here. And Alderman Tebow. Here. Okay, so we have a quorum. We're going to go ahead and move on with the agenda here. Um, first up on the agenda, we have uh, minutes from the uh, March 23rd, 2023 um, planning board meeting. Has anybody from the board had a chance to take a look at these minutes and want to make a motion as to whether they're Ready for us to accept as written or need amendments? Mr. Hirsch? Motion to accept the minutes as written. All right, so we have that motion to accept the uh, minutes of the 23rd of March 2023 uh, planning board meeting as written. Uh, okay, uh, next up, I'm going to go to communications. Is it, are you going to vote, Mr. Chair? Oh, we can take a vote. Take a vote. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Let's vote on that. Sorry. <laughs> so, uh, all those in. Who was the second? Nobody. I'll oh, Miss Harper, second. second. Um, any discussion on the minutes? All those in favor of accepting as written? Aye. 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 Opposed? And one abstention? Abstention. Yeah. Two abstentions. Okay. All right. So that passes. All right. Um, communications. Good evening, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Um, the following items uh, were sent out to you after the packets were mailed out. A memo dated April 5th from Sam Durfee regarding the Capital Improvements Program. A memo uh, also from Sam Durfee dated April 5th regarding um, the Temple Street application. You also received a memo from uh, Richard Maynard dated March 30th with a, also with a new set of plans. Then you have a memo, uh, two memos from Sanborn Head. One was dated October 14th. The other was dated November 11th. We also sent out uh, numerous emails from Concerned Abutters. And also for the record, we did receive 10 additional uh, emails that came in after the uh, cutoff time and those will be in your packet for the next meeting. So that's all we have. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, any reports from the uh, committees of liaison? None at this time. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and um, read the uh, procedure of the meeting <laughs> and hearings. All right. So at, after each legal notice of each conditional special use permit, site plan, or subdivision is read by myself, the board will determine if the application is complete and ready to take jurisdiction. Um, if we do take jurisdiction, a public hearing will begin at which time the applicant or their representative will be given time to present an overview and description of their project. They'll speak to whether or not they agree with the recommended staff stipulations and the board will have an opportunity to ask relevant follow-up questions of the applicant or staff. I'll next ask for testimony from the audience. I'll, wish for, I'll first ask for anybody wishing to speak in opposition or concern to a plan. This is your time to come forward to the microphone, state your name and address for the record, and express any concerns or ask any questions you may have regarding the plan. Next, I'll ask for testimony from anybody wishing to speak in favor of the plan. The board will then ask any relevant follow-up questions of the applicant. The applicant will then be given a rebuttal period at which time they'll speak to any concerns raised by the public testimony. After this is, completing, is completed, a public hearing will end and the board will resume a public meeting at which time we'll deliberate and vote on the application before us. I'd ask that everyone keep their remarks uh, to the subject at hand and not repeat what has already been said. The board wants to be fair to everyone and make the best possible decision based on testimony presented and considering all applicable approval criteria established in our Nashua revised ordinances for conditional special use permits, site plans, and subdivision plans. 
I'd ask anybody in the audience here, um, if you do have a cell phone, go ahead and turn it off or put it on vibrate. Um, and remind everybody that, uh, you know, be courteous to everybody that's uh, speaking up here and um, appreciate everybody's participation. So, moving on, I want to start by talking about the schedule for this meeting. So we have several things on the agenda. Um, the first order of business that we're going to take up, likely, and uh, this is going to obviously be have to decide it upon by the board, but I'm going to give you kind of my opinion of how the meeting's going to run. Um, is the 145 Temple Street business. Um, we ended in our last meeting at a, in a public comment session. Um, we're, my intent is to reopen that or ask the board to reopen that session for a one hour period. We did two hours last time. Um, at the conclusion of that one hour public comment session, um, we're gonna move into an applicant um, rebuttal session um, based on communications with the applicant my anticipation is they're going to ask for a continuance at that point um, that continuance is is likely going to be based on information that's been received um, subsequent to the last meeting the board is going to vote on that continuance um, and in all likelihood that continuance um, is going to happen in the the um, application is going to be continued to a uh, meeting in May sometime. And we'll, the details will come out as we work through the, the meeting itself. So it is my opinion at this point, because the board hasn't voted on anything, that there is unlikely to be any uh, public meeting tonight and unlikely to be any voting on that particular application. Um, and then we have a, a couple more items on our agenda to follow up after that. So just so everybody understands, that's basically what's probably gonna happen tonight. So, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and move in to the actual agenda. So first up, old business conditional special use permits. There are none. Uh, next, old business subdivision plan. This is uh, case number 821-0299. This is 145 Temple Street LLC owner. Uh, Green Ridge LLC applicant, and this is a proposed three lot subdivision. This property is located at 145 through 149 Temple Street. And I'm going to ask the board to, um, to consider um, removing these, you know, or recontinuing the, uh, the hearing uh, of that particular case along with old business site plans. A21-0300, A21-0301, and A21-0302, which are all the same uh, applicant, and they are site plans that we had had in the uh, hearing at our previous meeting. So with, for the board, for these four agenda items, um, is anybody want to make a motion as to you know, whether we want to reopen the uh, public hearing um, with the intent to continue, and my recommendation is to continue the public comment session for a one hour period and then move into the, essentially the next step of the hearing. So does anybody want to make a motion regarding that, Mr. Barley? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, I would make a motion as to Old business cases A21-0299, A21-0300, A21-0301, and A21-0302. As to all four cases that we remove those cases from the table, that we continue with the public hearing and comment, public comment period for a period of one hour. Okay, so we have that motion by Mr. Varley, as stated. Do we have a second by the board? Second by Alderman Tebow. Any further discussion by the board? Okay. Uh, hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. That motion passes. Okay, so the hearing is open now. Um, the next step is, again, um, I want to go directly into public comment. Um, I would like folks that want to speak 
again, here in the audience first, um, just sort of line up on the right, my right hand side over here. And I would ask that if you, ha if you have not spoken yet, essentially you did not get the chance last time, that you be at the front of the line. And those in line, if you did speak at the last one, please allow those folks that have not had a chance to speak to um, get to the front of the line. So. Okay, first up, thank you. And a reminder, state your name and address for the record. And a reminder, we have an hour here, so I'd ask, be, you know, make sure you're courteous of the rest of the folks on the line. So. Good evening. Can you hear, everybody hear me? Yep, I can. Yeah, you can grab that mic too. It comes right out. Sometimes it's, uh, it doesn't work that good. And you want to? I'll try, I'll try this. So, yeah, so that's pretty good. Good evening, yeah. uh, Mr. Chair and members of the board. I am Dr. John Durant. I'm from Environmental Monitoring uh, Partners and from uh, Arlington, Massachusetts. Uh, our firm specializes in air quality monitoring and modeling. I have uh, expertise in those areas. I have a, a PhD in environmental engineering and I'm a licensed professional engineer in the state of Massachusetts. Yeah, you might just grab the mic. It's unfortunately, it, it works better if you just kind of talk into it. Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, on behalf of my, uh, on behalf of her client, Riverfront uh, Landing, uh, attorney Amy Manzelli spoke to you uh, at the last meeting about a letter that I wrote with my colleague, Doc, Dr. Huda, in which we expressed our concerns about um, air, air quality impacts that the proposed plant is going to have on downwind communities, and um, it could possibly exacerbate um, existing environmental disparities. Tonight, I want to do two things. One, I want to review that letter um, with you, just the salient points, and I'd also like to bring to, to, to your attention to make sure you're aware of it supplemental information that I think would have uh, bearing on your deliberations. So in our, in our letter, which was uh, dated on March 20, 2023, and was submitted we to, you, yep. Yep. to you by uh, Attorney Mancelli in her letter from uh, March 2022, we made basically three points. One is that the proposed pollution controls on the HMA plant are really designed for particle removal, not gases. Most of the gases are going to go right through that bag house and will impact downwind communities. These gases were modeled by the applicant, um, including benzene from aldehyde. There's a lot of other chemicals that are going to come um, right out with benzene from aldehyde. Um, many of them are ozone precursors, many of them are toxic, many of them will form secondary organic aeros aerosols and cause additional uh, pollution problems. Uh, the second point is that diesel emissions from trucks coming in and out of the plant were not considered in, in any of the documentation that, that I received. There's going to be hundreds of trucks coming in and out of that facility on, on a daily basis, including uh, materials that are brought in for, for the aggregate. So the, 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 the trucks that are bringing, bringing, in, uh, bringing out a hot mix asphalt will, were considered, but the other trucks that are, are need to bring in other materials uh, as part of that operation were not considered. In, in aggregate uh, or in total, n none of the diesel emissions or any of those vehicles were, were considered. That's my second concern. The third concern is that none of this is going to improve air quality uh, in the vicinity of that plant. All these things will add to the additional burdens that they already face. So this will exacerbate air quality impacts and, and worsen environmental disparities in those downwind communities. The, the second point is the supplemental information that, that brings me here tonight. Uh, I, we drafted a letter. I'm not sure if you've seen it or not. Um, perhaps I could, I could pass it around to you. And I have two slides I'd like to show. Um, I have it here. Yeah, we, we have it here. Yep. Do you want to see copies of it? Uh, I think you just give it to planning. Yeah, okay. get it All to right. us. Yep. Right. Could I could see the slides? Yeah. So I'll make two points here. The first is represented by the wind roses that you see. So these are, are wind roses. They show uh, all the wind measurements that were made at a single point uh, over the course of a certain period of time. The figure on the left is from Concord, New Hampshire. The figure on the right is from, from Nashua, so it's lo local information. So these are wind roses. The, the spokes, the colored spokes, show the direction from, when the, from which the wind is arising. And they show the, the frequency of the, 
of, of wind speed uh, in, in direction. So the majority of the wind that is being measured at Concord New Hampshire Airport there is from the northwest and, and from other directions as well. And that, that's measured over the course of, I believe, uh, either one year or five years. The figure on the right is from the local airport. That's five years of record, 2018 through 2022. And it shows very similar situations. So the air, uh, air movement patterns in both Concord and Nashua are the same. Nashua shows a little bit more, uh, more frequent northwest winds. So the difference between the two airports is that there's a little bit more north, northwest wind in, in Nashua compared to Concord. This has bearing on the next slide, if I may see the next slide. This shows the location of the proposed asphalt plant uh, at, with an orange uh, star there. And because of the prevailing winds uh, at that, at, in Nashua, the, the area on the right, it shows the dispersion patterns of emissions that would be coming out of that plant. So it shows that the, the downwind communities are, are, um, that are impacted by the, by the dispersion patterns, and we're, we're only showing that out to about half of a mile, and that arc is about 100 degrees, something like that. So I didn't see any of that information in anything that the applicants um, presented, and that's why I wanted to make sure you were, were aware of it. So that's what really brings me here tonight. Okay. Just a, a few more points. So uh, the, the bottom line here, as I see it, is that the plant really is not going to improve air quality in, in the area. In fact, it's going to worsen it. It's going to increase the amount of, of pollutants in an already burdened community, and it'll, it'll exacerbate environmental inequities. So I, I welcome any questions you might have about any, any of the things I've, I've said tonight. And if not, um, I thank you for your attention and I wish you a good evening. Great, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, come on up. Okay. Can you hear me? I can, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to read this because I'm not an eloquent speaker. Uh, make sure um, you good evening. My name is Linda Kanikowski. I am a resident of Ward 3. I live on Shattuck Street, about one mile as the crow flies from the site of the proposed asphalt plant. I agree with all the thoughtful and well-researched points that have been made by the citizens and representatives during these meetings. I would like to say something on behalf of senior citizens that reside in Nashua. Currently, there is senior housing, a senior center, a bingo hall, restaurants, theaters, and shops that are within close proximity of the proposed asphalt plant. These seniors have worked hard and helped build the city. I am a senior who has lived in Nashville for 40 years, raised a family, worked in the healthcare field, paid taxes, and helped with projects in the city when I could. Now in retirement, I would like quiet enjoyment, recreation, and a clean environment to be available in the city that I live, and I'm sure many seniors share my opinion. I feel I can speak on this subject because I grew up a quarter mile from an asphalt plant, from birth to 10 years. At age two, I was hospitalized for heart and lung problems. I then became a severe asthmatic, which has plagued me my entire life. My dad, at age 66, died of cancer. He lived there longer than I did. Asphalt plants are dangerous. I don't care what their experts tell you. The chemicals have not changed. They're still as toxic. Just from listening to the presentations at these hearings, I feel these people will ignore the regulations and do whatever they want. After all, there's money to be made. I also think the city would have difficulty enforcing the rules once they get their foot in the door. As others have stated, they don't always play by the rules. The citizens of Nashua do not want, need, or deserve to have an asphalt plant put in our midst. I urge you to consider three most important things. Number one, the residents. Number two, the environment, clean air, clean water. 
Number three, the infrastructure of the city. All these things will be severely affected by the asphalt plant. I don't know how much time I have left on this planet, but I do not want to live downwind of an asphalt plant. Been there, done that. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. How's this? Can you hear me? Yep, we can okay. hear you. Yep. Thank you. My name is Andrea Rebeck. I live at 111 Atherton Avenue in Ward 3. Um, I submitted my written testimony to you folks yesterday, and I'm not going to read it again. These are just the highlights, um, but I wanted you to be sure and take a look at that submission because it contains the backup for my statements tonight. Um, I quote the law, I quote some correspondence from city engineers and consultants, so if you need more clarification, uh, you will find it there. I contend that the proposed project does not comply with the standards and criteria of the land use code, and thus the application should be denied. I refer you to chapter 190-19B, entitled Specific GI District Criteria. The following standards apply to the GI Zoning District. The first standard is, has the lo uh, following location criteria and states these, quote, shall be used in consideration of the placement of this district and the type and arrangement of uses within it, close quote. Three criteria are listed here. Uh, and the third one, B1C, states, quote, GI districts shall not have, shall have direct access to arterials and or major collector streets. GI districts shall not have direct access to a local street. Secondary or emergency access may be from a local street, close quote. Commercial street is a local street. It is not an arterial like Route 3, Everett Turnpike. It is not a collector like uh, the Daniel Webster Highway at the south end of town. Table 207-1 gives street classifications and defines a local street as one that does not fit the description of the other two. Not a very strong definition, but that's what it is. Uh, however, it makes one very strong statement, and that is, quote, through traffic usage discouraged, close quote. The proposed project relies on having heavy trucks exit directly onto a local street at the rate of one truck every two to three minutes. This is clearly in violation of the specified criteria that this traffic shall be routed directly to an arterial or a collector, but not onto a local street. A lot of those who have spoken in opposition to this application have stated that the proposed asphalt plant is just in the wrong place. The portions of the code that I have quoted show that the law states this very clearly. On the basis of that, I would urge the planning board to deny this application. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep, Okay, we can. great. I'm Barb DeDuces. I'm from Four Shelburne Road in Nashua. I'm a Nashua native. Um, my father was a Nashua native, attorney Len Shapiro. And if he was here with us now, he'd be right next to my mom standing up to some of the Nashua natives that are actually proponents of this plant. Um, I know emotions are not supposed to be part of this whole uh, sp uh, speech, I guess, of what, what we're doing right here, but or um, our comments. But watching the Zoom last week, it was extremely infuriating to see Attorney Prunier, I believe it was, talking about how um, talking about how it was the, um, it, we have to be thinking about here and now and not about the future. So we do have to be thinking about here and now. I mean, I'm sorry, we do have to be thinking about the future uh, because we are getting away from the general industry and moving into the master plan, which is for open space, greener space, pedestrian friendly. That is the way we're supposed to be moving, greener not more towards this type of industry. Um, he also said, I believe it was Attorney Prunier, who also stated Just that. Just a correction, it's not Attorney Prunier. It's, it's, okay. 
<laughs> All right. Well, the other. Unfortunately, um, he passed away a little while ago. All right. So to, okay. To try um, not to use that name. All right. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, well, the other comment made was that the job of the zoning or planning board is to uh, assist the developers, but I think the job of the planning board is their obligation is to the residents. As a teacher at Elm Street Middle School, I'm thinking of our kids every day. It's what I do, they're on my mind. So I'm constantly thinking of the future of our children and that this is what we're leaving for them. We have enough issues with hazardous waste we're dealing with with the tannery and we need to be thinking about, are we gonna add more to it? Are we, what are we doing? You, know, you need to be thinking about what we are doing here. Thank you. All right, thank you. Good evening. Uh, Mr. Chairman, board members, people of Nashua. My name is Susan Elberger. I'm a state representative from Nashua Ward 1. I serve on the Ways and Means Committee in the House of Representatives. It's a committee that focuses on the finances of proposed legislation, particularly the revenue aspects. You've heard a great deal about the health issues, noise issues, and environmental impact of this proposal. I want to focus on the traffic issues, assess, especially since they don't only have an impact on the communities right near the asphalt plant, but on the whole city. For those of you who are saying, I don't live there, why should it matter to me? Let me try to explain why it should matter to you. The asphalt people have been telling us that they expect to have 300 to 500 trips a day of tr trucks picking up and dropping off loads and supplies for making asphalt. Clearly, not all of it is going to be used in the area right around the plant. They'll be going to construction sites in Nashua and surrounding com communities. How will they get there? They'll be driving on the same streets that we use for all the other purposes we use our streets for, buying groceries, dropping off and picking up children from school, going to work, medical appointments, res restaurants, and shopping. The 300 to 500 trips a day average between 33 and 56 trucks per hour. It's doubtful that they will be going evenly throughout the day. In fact, they have told us that at peak times, there may be 100 trucks an hour. That means that there will likely be clumps of trucks, bunches going together, and then breaks in between. If they're going to Route 3 using West Hollis Street, they'll be going through nine traffic lights, and returning using Kinsley Street involves eight traffic lights. In addition, going from Route 3 to the facility involves going past our two hospitals, St. Joseph's and Southern New Hampshire Medical Center, including the emergency rooms for both. What happens if an ambulance needs to get to the emergency room and there are three or four trucks in front of the entrance? Trucks take time to stop and start again and make a lot of noise when they do, by the way. For trucks that may be going to Hudson, Keene, Amherst, and Hollis, they'll be going on streets that are not built for the uh, heavy traffic that will be involved. Bridge, Lowell, Canal, Main, Broad, and Amherst streets, in addition to Temple Street, are only some of the streets that will almost certainly see significant increases from the asphalt trucks delivering and picking up asphalt. Finally, the traffic pattern that has been suggested by the plant proponents includes entering through Temple Street and exiting through Commercial Street. This would mean that the departing trucks would leave by Commercial Street and turn left on Temple so that trucks would have to pass each other on a very narrow street, or if the trucks go from Commercial Street to East Hollis Street, they have to go on a very narrow road under the old rail bridge, take a 90 degree turn as they go. Then they have to either take another 90 degree turn to go on East Hollis Street towards Hudson, or a 180 degree turn to get on East Hollis going toward Main Street. My Toyota wasn't happy about doing this. I can't imagine a large heavy truck trying to make these turns. In short, the amount of traffic mostly on surrounding streets and also throughout the city from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m is a problem that affects not only the nearby residents, but also the entire city of Nashua. The increasing amount of wear and tear on our roads will require much more frequent repair and repaving, making any projected financial benefit from taxes much lower than we hope, or even worse, a loss. The project doesn't make sense for Nashua. I urge the planning board to turn down this proposal.
Yeah, good evening. Uh, my name is John Naso, and uh, I've written uh, two letters in uh, opposition to the project, so they're on file. We won't waste any time uh, rehashing. You're aware of the carcinogens and and, uh, and the issues with traffic and everything. But um, I did want to uh, I did want to read. I, got, I went on the website today to see if you you know when, when you you were going to convene again. And right on the website, uh, it's interesting. It says, and, I, and I'm quoting from, from uh, your, your mission statement, the planning board shall promote public interest in and understanding of the master plan and of the official map of the city as here and after provided. And it shall do all things necessary and incidental to the promotion and execution of said plan and map. So I hope you stay on mission when you make your final uh, decision and oppose it. Okay, thank you. Good evening. I'm uh, Reverend Allison Palm. I live at 14 Sawyer Street in Nashua, and I serve the Unitarian Universalist Church here in Nashua as well. Um, and I am here uh, to read a statement from eight, eight uh, faith leaders in the community. I'm here speaking for members of the interfaith community this evening, many of whom could not be with us because they are observing two important holidays. Tonight, many Christians in this community are commemorating Holy or Monday Thursday, when Jesus shared his last supper with the disciples, bending down to wash their feet and commanding them to love one another in the same way as Jesus loved them. And our Jewish siblings are celebrating the second Seder of Passover, a holiday that celebrates the Israelites' escape from slavery in Egypt. The themes of these two holidays are noteworthy this evening. Both of these ancient stories speak to a vision of a world without violence and persecution, particularly against those who are often overlooked by our society. Passover is all about liberation and the vision of a world redeemed from exile and slavery. Similarly, Jesus' core message was the vision of a world free from the forces of empire and domination and centered on justice for all people. Even on Maundy Thursday, the eve of his crucifixion, Jesus reject rejected the use of violence, reaching out to heal one who had come to arrest him. In this season of Holy Days, we are considering a proposed asphalt plant against the backdrop of stories of liberation and defiance of empire and violence, we believe our faith tr traditions give us an imperative to speak out with our neighbors against this proposal. We do not believe that this asphalt plant will have a low impact on the neighborhood and the larger community. Bringing in this type of industrial development would bring great harm to the quality of life for people in the neighborhood, causing pollution, traffic issues, noise, and stress, as you've heard. It would endanger the health and well-being of the hundreds of people who make their home in the vicinity of the proposed plant. Despite the claim that this is an industrial area, the site of the proposed plant is surrounded by housing that already exists, housing that has been improved by this body to be developed in the coming months, and a robust collection of social services. Uh, a social service agencies who serve vulnerable people in the city. An asphalt plant is not compatible with the existing uses of the surrounding area. Building an asphalt plant in this location would be an act of violence to the community that is already there and to those who will come in the future. Our faith traditions call us to speak out against violence, especially when it disproportionately affects the most vulnerable among us. We urge you in the name of compassion and love for our neighbors to reject this proposed asphalt plant and to preserve the vision for a just and equitable Nashua as expressed in the master plan. Thank you. Thank you. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Saida Calderón, residente en Nacha por más de 
dos décadas vivo cerca en Arlington. Good evening, everyone. My name is Angela Mercado, and I'll be interpreting. Um, this is Saira De Leon. She has been living in Nashua for more than 20 years in the Arlington Street area. Y no estamos de acuerdo, o sea, no estoy de acuerdo con el proyecto debido a que es un problema para la salud. I, I am not um, in favor of this project because it can cause health issues. He hablado con personas de la comunidad ya que vivimos mucha, mucha gente cerca del proyecto. I have spoken with many families around the area because, uh, to talk about the project. No estamos de acuerdo debido a los problemas que puede traer eso. Ya tengo la experiencia que mi esposo trabajó por 11 años en una compañía de asfalto. Uh, due to the, um, I've been, my husband has been working um, for an asphalt company for more than 11 years. Y los problemas de salud, respiratorio y cáncer de él y los compañeros no son buenos. Um, due to him working so many years, um, they have, uh, him and his co-workers have developed um, cancer and respiratory problems. Y no quiero que mis nietos pasen por la misma experiencia. And I don't want my grandchildren to go through this experience. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you. Buenas noches a todos. Mi nombre es Acela Ulloa. Good evening, everyone. My name is Acela Ulloa. Resido aquí en Ashra, en la Amherst Park. I live here in Ashra, in Amherst Park. Tengo 18 años viviendo en Ashra. I have been living in Ashra for 18 years. Estoy aquí para representar a mi comunidad y a las iglesias, a la escuela que están cerca de ese proyecto. I'm here to represent the community, the churches, and the schools that are nearby the project. Que no estamos de acuerdo de que hagan esa construcción en, en esa área de Nashua. We are not, we do not, we are against this construction near that area. Una porque eso es muy tóxico, dañino para la salud y para el ambiente. It's considered to be toxic for our health and for the environment. Y a mí no me gustaría eso para mi familia, para mi nieto y para mí personalmente y todo que estamos aquí. I do I do not want this for my family, for my grandchildren and for the community and everyone here. Y todos los problemas que pueden causar los camiones, los ruidos y todas esas cosas. And everything that can cause about um, having the trucks and the uh, how loud they, they can be and Muchísimas gracias. Buenas noches. Thank you so much and good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the planning board and the audience, and thank you for the, my predecessors who had such good information regarding some of the facts and figures re, uh, related to this project. Um, I sent an um, email to the planning board um, Regarding this project, my feelings about this project. Um, Could you just give your name and uh, address? Uh, Berta, um, Berta Denton, Ward 3. Um, I'd like to read part of it. Mm -hmm. I'm a 30 year resident of um, Nashua. My husband and I moved up here in 1993. And uh, when we moved here, um, Nashua is actually pre a pre almost a dying city. And <laughs> we moved up from Boston. And we we're here a few weeks, and Miller's was going out of business. I don't know if anyone remembers Miller's. And uh, Howard and I looked at each other and, and actually wondered whether we made a mistake coming up. And since then, um, of course, Nashua has blossomed and bloomed, and um, we've lived to know that we made the right decision. And at this point, um, I am just delighted that I live in Nashua. And um, I was at the uh, planning board meeting on March 23rd, and um, 
got to hear the company executives uh, speak about their plans to develop 145 Temple Street, and they certainly put a slick coat of red paint on the smokestacks and the exhaust pipes they're going to build. And uh, the before and after pictures couldn't, in my mind, be a more convincing argument for denying this approval. Um, of course, the show and tell didn't capture the, the deleterious um, exhaust fumes and the odor and commotion caused by the 150 trucks coming and going a day, the eight hours per day, six days a week. Um, and I'm glad that um, the man, the, the, the guy talked about the uh, wind factors and the chemical exhaust. And I'm very glad the woman talked about the traffic commotion that would be uh, impacting on our city and on our roads. I, I wasn't quite as uh, scientific about getting that information, but I could sort of imagine that, that happening. And the testimony of the woman who, tested, who spoke to the safety of the emissions from the asphalt company um, cited sources that I was certain had to be verified by research studies, far more, than, far more probing than she cited in her, her diatribe. When we talk about city life and what makes a city, um, livable. We always talk about what city planners and government officials do to make our city better for our residents. And your website cites that, set, talks about that. And I, I was a, a resident of New York City, and you know, when we see um, sky views of New York City, we see that Central Park, the big Central Park, and um, Prospect Park in Brooklyn, and even Boston with uh, the Boston Common and the Arboretum. And th these grassy, beautiful parks are surrounded by sk skyscrapers and luxury apartments. And um, th these all happened more than a century, this planning all happened more than a century ago because when, when uh, people, the planning commissions and forward thinking individuals were thinking about putting aside spaces to make cities more livable. And we're at a juncture now in Nashua, um, making a decision that the next generations of Nashuan, Nashua people will either applaud us or vilify us for a decision about this asphalt plan. So how, how can it be a right decision to approve an asphalt plan in the middle of multiple housing units and single homes of a major urban center that's in the middle of in the middle of this beautiful city that we're trying to bloom and blossom. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Tony and Isley. I am a Nashua resident of most of my life. I also um, am a mom and raise my kids here. I have grandchildren now that are also here in Nashua. My uh, greatest concern is that they are going to Dr. Crisp School in Ward 7. This asphalt plant will bring toxic chemicals to them, which will impair their breathing, impair their growth, impair their, their brain processing. Um, I don't want to repeat of what has already happened in the past. In behind um, Dr. Crisp, they have already had a, um, a garbage dump. When my children were young, we had to close that whole area off, dig it off. It was unusable for a while. I mean, it is perfect now. But the lengths that they had to go through and the layers that they had to bring up just to get rid of all the chemicals to even make it livable again was hugely expensive, not only in our pockets, but in our, in our lives. So I just want to say that I'm against this fully and completely, and I hope that you all consider our health and our well-being when you're making your decision. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Christy Basada. I live at 12 Nutmeg Drive. I'm one of the pastors of Main Street United Methodist Church. 
And I initially had intended only to speak last time, but over the last two weeks, I've been extremely troubled by the applicant's characterization of the Temple Street neighborhood and the surrounding area. Uh, according to the, the uh, slideshow, we saw dumpsters and dirt piles and uh, paved parking lots, but I have, as a housing advocate in this community, have known this neighborhood well and for a long time. And I wanted to be certain that I was operating from a factual and not a sentimental framework, and so I went to the city's GIS maps, which are extremely useful. And I stuck a pin in the proposed site of the plant and asked for a quarter mile buffer to see what was there. And then I did it again at a half a mile to see what was there. And of course, there were things that I was really sure were there, like really uh, housing for thousands of people, small scale industry that could also fit into park industrial or a local business zone. It wouldn't need general industrial. Lots of small family owned stores, restaurants, laundromats, barber shops, repair shops, supply stores. And of course, Make It Labs that hosts our high school robotics team in the city and is one of the coolest creator spaces I have ever seen. But what I also found is the backbone of Nashua's social services network. Within a quarter mile of the radius, a quarter mile radius of the proposed asphalt plant, I found Southern New Hampshire Services, Corpus Christi Assistance, and Food Pantry, Catholic Charities, Family Promise of Southern New Hampshire, Casimir Place, and Gateways. These agencies serve people needing WIC and emergency food services, fuel, electric, and rental assistance, veteran services, early education and daycare assistance for low-income families trying to rise through employment and education, parenting and adoption resources, funds for dental care and dentures, transitional housing for families in crisis, affordable permanent income-based housing, immigration legal services, a senior day program, and services, equipment, and respite care for people with developmental disabilities, autism, and chronic illness. That's within one quarter mile circle. If you expand that circle to a half a mile, I found the Arlington Street Community Center, Dr. Crisp Elementary School, the Nashua Senior Activity Center and Senior Housing, which has been mentioned this evening, June Karen Park, the DeVita Dialysis Center, the Toll Street Mission and Food Pantry, the Hope Center for Women, our newest women's homeless shelter, and the Nashua Soup Kitchen and Shelter, which provides food, school supplies, and a myriad of other services and assistance to the community. There are also many churches in this circle. If you go just a few steps, and I really mean a few steps outside that 10 minute walk, you get the Nashua Housing and Redevelopment Authority, Greater Nashua Mental Health, the Nashua Soup Kitchen's new men's, women's, and family shelter, the Day Cafe Day program that it takes place in St. Patrick's Church, many medical and law offices, the Hillsborough County Courthouse, the Greater Nashua Dental Connection, which provides low-cost dental services both to people without insurance and children from our 18 local schools, and disabled American veterans. This is a tiny little circle in the map of Nashua, and all of that is right there. If you go a block from these things, you get to Main Street, to the new Center for the Performing Arts, to the Southern New Hampshire Medical Center, the Nashua Public Library, and so many restaurants and activities. These are all within a 10 minute walk of the site. And many of these social service agencies serve walkers and people who do not have cars and ride bikes. The fact is that Temple Street is not a dirt pile. It is very much an alive, thriving, and striving neighborhood and this proposed plant is not only incompatible with and detri detrimental to most of the surrounding neighborhood, but completely out of character, even with the industry that is already there. This is exactly the kind of scenario that the suitability report required by the Transit Oriented Development District was put in place to prevent. And so I beg you, please reject this proposed use and protect this critically important part 
of our city and its social services networks. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Sherry Dutsey. I live at 18 Swart Terrace, and I'm a state rep, um, and I sit on the uh, Environment and Agriculture Committee. One of the things that I have learned about being on the Environment and Agriculture Committee uh, is that there are a lot of rules and regulations that, ne that New Hampshire should have in place, but we do not. Um, it is my understanding New Hampshire is what we call a Dillon state, which means that cities and towns cannot do anything unless regulations and bills come down from the state to enable cities and towns to do it. One of the things that we've been working on for the last several years, believe it or not, uh, is a statute that would uh, define how far away from a water a, a landfill should be cited. Now you would think that that would be something that we would have figured out a while ago. The, what we have in statute right now is that you can cite a landfill within 200 feet of a body of water and that was put in effect 30 years ago and it was not scientifically based. I don't know what it was based on. The reason I say that is right now, last year, legislation was passed to make it easier to permit what we call advanced recycling facilities. These facilities are neither advanced nor they're recycling. They're um, high intensity incineration. And of course, along with this, they're going to add a lot of um, pollutants into the air. I mean, very bad cancerous things. Right now, we basically do not have a lot of uh, laws on the books that will go ahead and regulate this. One of the things that I'm hearing about now that's going on at the State House is that some bills are probably going to be coming forward where we begin to look at standards for cumulative air pollution. So we have, we, we, we don't even have a baseline at this point, and then you add more onto it, and at what point have you reached the tipping point, or are we going over the tipping point? So I bring that to you today because this is just the first of what is going to come before the planning board, I'm sure, in the coming years. The American Chemical Council is putting, is, has a nationwide push to get advanced recycling all over the country. This is going, I mean, this is clearly going to be an issue with air pollution, very, very similar to what you're going to be dealing with in making this decision about the asphalt plant. So I just wanted to kind of give you that perspective from what's going on at the state um, when you make your decision. And I know, I know you're in a tough, a tough position, but one of the things we don't want to do, um, we had an expert come to our committee who talked about no big deal, we can remediate, we can remediate. Remediation is not what we should be going for. We should be going for prevention. We have a situation over in Portsmouth with, where they've been remediating the Coakley landfill um, for the last 30 years. Um, they have situations in Ohio where they're still remediating uh, uh, railroad uh, issues that were 50 years ago. So we don't want to permit something now that we're going to be remediating 10, 20, or 30 years down the road. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Bob Simons, and I work for SMC Management, and we own the residences at Riverfront Landing Phase 2 over on Bridge Street. Um, and probably what I'm going to say tonight is repetitive. I spoke at the last meeting, but I just wanted to emphasize our desire to uh, have some accountability, right? So we've heard a lot of testimony that the traffic study has been generated from some industry standard reports from the ITE, but that conflicted with what the owner or the developer stated he anticipated for traffic. So. The traffic study that you have does not represent what they even believe they're going to put on the streets. And we all know that there isn't a street in or out of this place 
that isn't already at a pretty poor level, ser level of service. Um, I think you have some dissenting information uh, that pertains to the noise, uh, the pollution, a lot of factors weren't even considered because the industry standard reports didn't require them to. So you guys have a big challenge in that you have to sort through the reports that you've been given that have been generated by industry standards that don't necessarily correlate to what is anticipated here. And I think that's what a lot of people are very sensitive to, is that once you allow this, there'll be no way to undo what you do at, at this level. So the other concern is, you know, is there a way for a planning board to hold someone accountable to what they represent, they plan to do to a community? If they only represent, they're going to pollute this much or make that much noise or put that much traffic on. How do you hold them accountable to that if, in fact, there's a fair amount of evidence that says that they're not going to be able to do what they represented? So um, I guess I'm not sure how you do that other than make conditions on the approval and hold them accountable to it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, thank you for having me here tonight. I want to ask that you check references on Newport Construction, references on their business, and on Temple Street, references with residential people, and references particularly with the city. They've done work for the city, and I think the best uh, um, past behavior is the best indicator of future behavior. So it's very important to find out exactly what kind of people are coming in here and what they're um, going to do. Also, the legacy, I'd like to ask you, you're, going to cre you're creating a legacy here in Nashua. And do you want the legacy to be, in 50, 30 years, it to be the same or worse off or better? What broke my heart the last night I was here was their kids are using that to find their own path to school. These are future surgeons. We're going to ask them to spend 16 hours uh, doing a quadruple bypass on us. And we don't have the minimum decency to give them a safe path to school. Um, we're going to have police officers who are going to risk their lives in and out every day for us for 30 years. And we don't, have, we don't give them a safe path to school. Um, you know, we can go on and on. But I would ask, this is a very emotional, I live 300 yards from there, and I would ex expect you um, to at least consider the children. Um, they're going to put some um, deodorant into the toxic fumes to make them taste better. But again, this is our future. These are the people that are going to go to war for us. We got to protect them. And putting that down there is not going to make a difference. The neighborhood is already changing. Temple Street Diner, it used to be a mess, overgrown weeds all over the place. But I noticed as I was driving by over the past year, there was high-end cars there, BMWs, Infinities, Acuras. It was the people coming from the new buildings in town, the River Street Apartments. Now I drive by and I see it's beautiful. They cut all the weeds. They filled in all the holes. It's a perfect parking lot. Inside, it's even better. And they also add about 3 or $4 to each menu item. So it's coming up. It's raising up. And Nashua's turning around. The people who live in the River Apartments, they're actually buying up houses in French Hill and that neighborhood because they're affordable compared to other houses who are in suburban neighborhoods. They like the neighborhood. They're eating at the local Temple Street Diner. They're eating in downtown. And if you want 50 years from now, that can be the cornerstone of Nashua. If you keep bringing in the young, educated professionals, that place will have restaurants, it will be an extension of downtown, and your legacy will be beautiful. You will be remembered as the people who did the right thing. And I want to thank you up until this point. You've done an exquisite job. You've listened to everybody. I felt you heard me. And then all the decisions you've made so far have been exquisite. But the right decision here tonight is to say no because of the reasons I've outlined. So please, don't do it to our children. We're going to need them. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. All right. Um, just doing a time check here. I still have about 12 minutes left on my... Um, original thing here so is there anybody else here in the audience before I go to the zoom skippies here okay 
All right, I'm going to go ahead and close down the audience here portion, and I'm going to go towards the, yeah, I just, if you folks could listen to me, that would be helpful. Um, can we look on Zoom? Yeah, with your hand raised. All right, why don't you just, just name someone, Linda, and then we'll go from there. Uh, Timothy Sinat. Tim Sinat. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me okay in the, uh, in the auditorium there? Yes, we can. Yep. All right, thank you. And I'll, just once more before I begin, um, I was going to ask permission. I would be there in person tonight, but unfortunately I've fallen ill. Um, is it all right uh, if I utilize the uh, share screen functionality here to share some uh, images with you? Yeah, just give me your um, your address too, your name and address. And yeah, certainly. Sure. It's uh, Tim Sennett. I live at 62 Underhill Street in uh, Nashua. That's in uh, Crown Hill in Ward 7. Yep. Um, I wanted to come before you tonight to address... Um, a uh, previous speaker had mentioned earlier some uh, characteristics that were asserted about the neighborhood by the applicant. Uh, two weeks ago, the applicant began their presentation by sharing a photograph of their yard, excuse me, from uh, located on the site of the, uh, uh, showing a material shed on the uh, site of the inner city materials. I'm gonna um, pull up the share screen functionality so that I can uh, reference these as I go. And uh, let me know in a moment. You should be able to see uh, an image of a green shed. Mm, not yet, but. Not yet? No. Oh, that's why I didn't click the button. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can now. Yeah. All right, perfect. So this is a, um, a very similar image of the uh, shed that they uh, shared two weeks ago. Uh, the applicant cited this building as being a site buffer for residents located on Sheds Avenue. Uh, which is across Commercial Street from the proposed site. Uh, the picture provided, however, similar to the uh, display that I'm showing you here, showed the building from the vantage point that one would have if they stood on Temple Street and faced in the direction of East Hollis Street. Uh, now you can see from this uh, image here that this um, already illustrates a flaw in the claim that this would serve as a vision blocker because uh, it was stated that the combined shed uh, inner city materials, that's this green building right here, as well as the Newport Construction Building would block such views. But if you stand back from this wider distance on the other side of this uh, fence, right on Temple Street, uh, you can already see that the, one of the apartment buildings on Murray Court looks directly over the Newport Construction Building. So already we've got one building here that is not being buffered from where the proposed asphalt production is going to be taking place. Uh, further, and I'm going to move on to my second image here. Okay. Sheds Avenue runs perpendicular to this straight st stretch of Temple Street and has a much different vantage point than what was suggested by the evidentiary photo. Uh, here on Sheds Avenue, which is where I'm standing in this photo, there are at least seven residential structures on either side of the street. Four of them, located directly behind me where I'm standing taking this photo, have this unobstructed view of the space that comprises Newport and inner city materials properties, including the building that currently sits where the proposed asphalt production will go into place. The actual positioning of this uh, green material shed relative to the residences on Sheds Avenue would ensure bet that at best, maybe half of one building would have the proposed operations as they're laid out on the applicant's site plan, obscured by inner city materials shed. In fact, even from lower elevations, which is below the stone wall on the other side of this fence, down on Commercial Street, which runs parallel to Sheds Avenue, there's still visibility of where the proposed site is going to be going, only just blocked by the, uh, by the uh, Newport Materials site. Um, I was really happy that they brought up Sheds Avenue two weeks ago, uh, because it was an area I was already familiar with, and this view of inner city materials I was already familiar with, because uh, 20 years ago, when I first met my wife, she had a legal address on Commercial Street that had a frontage entrance on Sheds Avenue. So this is a view that we're very familiar with. You can see again the building that is where the uh, proposed production would go and the Henry Hanger building here in the distance. Uh, I'd like to take some time to also further address a series of photographs that the applicant shared two weeks ago conveying, in their words, what folks in this neighborhood look at every day. Uh, the photos depicted several instances of graffiti, material storage, fencing, and overgrowth. One photo depicted the backside of the nearby Granite Group site, which is across from Newport's main entrance on Temple Street, 
showing overgrowth and perhaps even signs of possible uh, encampment. What wasn't depicted, however, was the viewpoint from almost that exact same spot facing in the opposite direction, which is depicted in my photo here. Now, right off, off to the uh, cutoff of my photo here is the uh, backside of the Granite Group location. Uh, but from this vantage point, uh, this is the fence where I took the picture of the um, material shed here. And you can see, as far as the eye can see, all the way up to the old Indian head bank here, housing. Uh, from here, you can see the most front facing of three apartment buildings that exist on Murray Court. That'd be this building right here. Uh, those buildings are located directly behind the Newport building. Uh, less visible but still evident from this vantage point are five residential buildings that uh, start between Gorman Ave and Commercial Street, as well as much larger apartments even further back at Casimir Place, which is located by and within the old church here. Uh, and if we step back even further, one is able to e even able to see just how close, in proximity, the uh, densely uh, residential neighborhood here, starting on Murray Court, is to Newport's building right here. Uh, another photo that the applicant shared depicted the material storage yard that is currently in place across Temple Street, located behind the Temple Street Diner. The photo includes uh, a long out of view service garage to the right, but is neatly cropped to the left so that the extension of the small traffic circle, uh, which would extend up to Amory Street, is not visible. Uh, if we move to the left of the photo that they shared, we can see up the eastern side of Amory Street, seven moderately housed or moderately sized multifamily housing units, along with additional neighborhoods running deeper to the east directly behind all these. Uh, additionally, on the western side here, just beyond these uh, utility poles, um, and on the other side of Granite Group, right on the corner here, are two more large multifamily units. Uh, the applicant's photos depict what some who may be unfamiliar with the area may consider a strictly industrial area, but they don't tell the whole story. The characteristics of this neighborhood are significantly more populated than these photos would have suggested, and to suggest otherwise is really just a practice in willful dishonesty recognizable by anybody who lives in this neighborhood or who frequents the area. Such claims are also evident in the suggestion that the Henry Hanger building, which is visible uh, from some vantage point or another in many of the previous cited photos, is sitting vacant and inactive with nothing really happening there. In spite of evidence to the contrary, as recently as a rainy Tuesday in late March last week, when workers could be seen spotted working in and around the building, removing aging features inconsistent with future site plans for the site. Uh, perhaps the most telling pieces of evidence in this neighborhood's identity as a improperly zoned area in desperate need of reevaluation are a line in the city code outlining standards for general industrial zones within the city, which were actually mentioned by a previous speaker tonight, and a feature visible right outside of Newport's main entrance on Temple Street. The first, the aforementioned uh, passage located in section 190-19 part B, states that while GI districts shall have direct access to arterials or major collector streets, GI districts shall not have direct access to a local street. While I would even concede that streets such as Temple Street, Commercial Street, East Hollis, and even Amory Street might fit the definition of an arterial or collector street, Nashua's zoning map shows that within this same GI zone, plainly local and densely populated residential streets such as Howard Street, Sheds Ave, Worcester Street, Hoyts Lane, Gorman Ave, Scripture Street, Union Street, Robinson Court, Warren Street, Van Buren Street, Jackson Street, Belknap Street, C, D, and E Streets, Chase Street, and Hobbs Ave all improperly fall under the GI zone and clearly show that Nashua's zoning needs to be reevaluated before something of this magnitude can be haphazardly approved on the basis of outdated zoning that is not characteristic with the, or consistent with the characteristic of Nashua or its stated future vision for 2023 and beyond. Uh, the second is affixed to a utility pole, just steps away from the primary entrance to new, the Newport construction site and within perfect sight of the proposed location of the asphalt production facility. That would be an NTS city bus stop sign just below a double facing sign that reads, slow children. It's my opinion that the need for such a sign cautioning motorists to be alert for children playing in and around the nearby streets would never exist in an area strictly designed for industrial use. Its presence here should be evident enough that this is an area occupied and frequented by families and children and that an asphalt manufacturing 
operation is as inconsistent with the characteristic of this neighborhood as it is with the city's master plan. Thank you all for your time tonight. I really appreciate the patience that you've shown for this. All right, thank you very much. Okay, um, we've still got time for another person. Is there another one on there? One? Yeah. yeah, Chris Harris's. Chris Harris's. Hi, I'm Chris Harris's from 10 Chester Street. I only need a minute. Um, what I want to show you is something good that Newport did in Chelmsford, and unfortunately, they're not taking that good thought to Nashua. Can I share a screen for one minute? Sure. Thank you. Okay, this is their Chelmsford plant, and if you notice, it's, uh, no joke intended, literally a stone's throw from the highway from Route 3. What they also did, what you see in this big white area here, is they located the asphalt plant right next to a quarry. So they get the aggregate literally steps away. They don't have to go on a road to get the aggregate, which is a great idea, it's brilliant. What you're also gonna notice is it's a, it's not a densely populated area. There's lots of green space around it. There's little residential clusters, but nothing too bad. If you now, hang on one second, sorry. Hide something. If you now take a look at the same level of Nashua, you can see how densely populated it is. And I mean, if we flick back and forth real quickly, it's not hard to see the difference. And if we keep zooming out to find out how long is it going to take someone to get to a highway from there, you got a long ways to go through the city area. So once again, they did something really smart. They don't, uh, the folks that got up before me talked about uh, all the inner streets and whatnot, but the other point that the one of the gentlemen made uh, when he came up earlier was that they're going to have to bring a lot of trucks to bring aggregate in. And that's not considered in the plan, where once again, this plan didn't have to consider it because the aggregate was local. And lastly, if you want to read a good article, grab the NPR article that talks about the, the, the $20,000 groundwater violations and the noise pollution. You can't beat experience. And uh, when Linda got up earlier and talked about her childhood experience, uh, getting those gases causing lifelong asthma, you know, you can write everything on paper and it looks great on paper, but you can't beat personal experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, we we're right on time for my 60-minute um, public comment. I'd like to, you know, just say I appreciate everybody from the public showing up and um, the, the good um, points that everybody's provided and the decorum that everybody's had. Um, it definitely is helpful for the board. Um, and um, we're going to continue on now with our um, intended itinerary here. Um, so the next step in this is going to be, uh, I'm going to ask the applicant to come up. And this is essentially the beginning of the um, rebuttal period. Um, but uh, Mr. Perlman, you can go ahead and indicate what you were intending to present tonight. Mr. Chairman, members of yep. the board, good evening. My name is Andy Perlman, attorney with Pruny and Perlman here on behalf of um, the applicants 145 Temple Street uh, LLC and Greenridge LLC. Uh, with us tonight, Mr. Chairman, is our full team that we had last time. In addition, on Zoom is co-counsel John Weaver from the McLean office. Um, and Mr. Chairman, um, we have a full um, re rebuttal uh, prepared, but I have a continuous request that I emailed in um, uh, the, or earlier today, and I'll speak to that. Uh, we are prepared to have um, Jason Plord of VHB speak to traffic issues. He's been um, t in, in communications with uh, Wayne Husband, and there's been some progress on that point. Uh, Dr. Laura Green um, is here as well. Um, she has done additional work um, with, as a result of some comments from two weeks ago, and we're prepared to have um, that uh, testimony and that evidence presented tonight. Um, and then I would ask that the board uh, continue the hearing to allow us um, time to address the many new um, items that have come in very recently. Uh, we received 
uh, Mr. Durfee's memo yesterday. We received um, the Sandboard Head updated memo yesterday. We haven't had time to review and respond. Uh, likewise, we have um, uh, appraisals to address, and there was a report from uh, the Walker memo from the Conservation um, Law, Law Foundation. So we ask that um, we be given um, time to address those, um, and we don't want this to drag on any longer than anyone else, but we do want a fair hearing for the applicant to address these uh, new concerns. Um, so, Mr. Chairman, if, if, if I may, if it's, up to the, if it's okay with the board, I would have uh, Mr. Plourd, Dr. Green speak, and then perhaps the board take up the continuance request. Yeah, okay, I just want to confer with staff. Um, do we have, uh, is there someone from Sanborn head here tonight as well? Yes, Steve Zemba is with us via Zoom. Okay, so um, I think what I might do is perhaps have, you should go. have um, Mr. Zemba present sure. first, and then I'm gonna go to VHB and then Dr. Green, and then we'll hear continuance. So, thank okay. you. So great. So, is um, okay. Yep. Hi, I'm, I'm Steve Zumba from Sanborn Head, and thank you. I thought I would just give a quick summary of the report that we prepared for the city. We've been reviewing materials that have been provided by the city, uh, by the applicant, I should say. Sorry. I, I, by the way, am an engineer, uh, a consulting company, uh, and uh, I work out of actually Burlington, Vermont, so didn't make the trip down there. Maybe I should have, but it didn't tonight, so I'm joining you by Zoom. Uh, and I would just like to give a quick summary of, you know, what we looked at and what we're seeing and, you know, what we sort of recommend the facility do. And as, you know, very quick, background for me. I've worked for hot mix asphalt plants. I've also worked as a third party reviewer of hot mix asphalt plants for the town of Uxbridge. So I've been on both sides of the equation in terms of, you know, people proposing them and people, you know, reviewing them. Uh, we're acting as a reviewer here. And so what we look for are, you know, things that would cause problems in the community, things like odors and dust and um, emissions of that sort. And so there's some detail in our report as to some of the things the applicant is proposing to curb those emissions. And, you know, it, it's, it's been said, I think, a few times tonight that, you know, those proposals are as good as the diligence that you need to operate this plant. And, you know, in the urban area that it's in, the plant will have to operate very diligently and keep up their operations and management maintenance. Um, so, uh, actually, I should be able to turn on my video, right? Sorry about that. Yep, we can see you. Yep. <laughs> uh, you think I know how to use Zoom at this point in my life, but uh, anyway, the you know the, you have to maintain the plant and keep it operating correctly. So some of our recommendations are oriented towards checking out and verifying some of the things that are the, the applicant is proposing. There are things that could be done. Um, uh, some of the information that was provided, for instance, on the odor suppressant, we didn't think was sufficient enough. We think they need more information on that, the third party evaluation of it. Uh, you can do air pollution monitoring. A lot of uh, the concerns tonight have been about air pollutants. There are ways to monitor air pollutants and you know that wouldn't normally be required for a hot mix asphalt plant, but given this urban location, it might make some sense to do some air monitoring. And, to, they'll get permit conditions from DES eventually. You could enhance or ask for more than this, just those permit conditions in terms of the stack emissions. A lot of the modeling and dispersion studies that have been done by the applicant depend on emission rates. And you can, there are ways to measure some of those emission rates and you could require that to be done periodically. So those are the types of things that we're recommending and uh, it's kind of detailed in the report, but if you have questions now, I could take those. Okay, thanks. Um, I will open up to the board at this time, so everybody understands um, Sam Warnhead was retained by the city um, to do some of the study. You all have the report and the, uh, the comment letters, and I guess this is an op opportunity for the board to uh, ask any questions <coughs> of this consultant um, at this time that you may have. 
Mr. Riley. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had one question. Um, we received a report that was on behalf of the Conservation Law Foundation from uh, Catherine Walker, and you know one of the criticisms that she offered was that she indicated that the the analysis that was done by the applicant included only a limited number of pollutants um, and chemicals. And so I'm just wondering if, if you could speak to that in your experience. What what is you know sort of is the analysis that was done by the applicant sort of as a baseline? Is that sort of consistent in your experience with what you know would, would typically be reviewed in terms of a consideration of the particular pollutants at issue? Uh, sure, um, I, I am familiar actually with that um, comment. I did look at the same reports that, that Catherine Walker looked at. Uh, there was a, a two items, and, and Dr. Green is there, you can ask her that same question tonight, but there are two items that were submitted by Dr. Green. One was in her group, one was a, a memo that I think talked mostly about benzene and formaldehyde, which are two pollutants that would be emitted by the plant. Uh, but her spreadsheet analysis includes a whole host of pollutants, uh, all the ones that are listed in EPA's documentation. So there are many, many more pollutants they actually considered. They just don't talk about them in their summary memo. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions by the board for consultant? Point? Okay. All right. Uh, I think we're good here at the board and appreciate your um, summary of uh, your current progress on the report and um, we'll get back to you if we have other questions. So, okay. Thank right. you. Yep. Thank you. All right. At this time, I'll, I'll invite uh, Mr. Roman here, you back up and uh, let's we'll start with uh, VHP. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Jason Plord, VHB. Uh, just want to kind of clarify a few things sure. uh, from last last meeting and um, where we are in the process. Yep. Uh, so, just to make sure that you know all cards on the table, we followed the process that's outlined within the city's guidelines for the preparation of traffic impact reports and traffic management plans. In that document, it says that we need to use the latest edition of the Institute of Transportation Engineers Trip Generation Manual for all land use codes. We did that. Um, the information that you heard at our last meeting was that I presented the ITE rates as compared to what um, Rick DeFelice had presented. I talked about how those were the average rates that were based on the ITE methodology, and Mr. DeFelice was talking about up to certain numbers. So that's a peak. You know, instead of an average, it's a peak. So there is some variation. We follow the city's guidelines by using the ITE data. The second part is that we then followed the process that was developed by city officials. So there's been a lot of coordination, as you re may remember from our last presentation, all the different dates, all the different submissions, the correspondence going back and forth. And so we were providing additional information all the way up until the end of January to be able to address some of the comments. Um, there was also a comment that was made this evening saying that we were gonna be adding 100 vehicles per hour. I think um, that's a little confusing because the 100 vehicles per hour is the actual threshold that the city has. We, in numbers that we presented, we don't even get anywhere near 100 vehicles per hour. That 100 vehicles per hour is within the city's guidelines of whether you need to automatically prepare a full traffic study or not. We are less than half of that number based on the numbers that were reviewed and accepted by the city. So I just want to make sure I clarified that. Um, so at the last meeting, uh, we also had mentioned that we had received the March 16th uh, memorandum from Joe Mandola, and, um, and some of those comments were related to turning movements and the distribution of vehicles uh, and, and the trucks you know, on the different roadways. And right, right now we're working with Mr. Husband on that um, to make sure you know, we supplied a lot of the different turning movements and the distribution in our January 31st, 2023 memo and uh, there may be some more information that he's looking for. We'll be happy to supply that information. Okay. And that's all I have. Other questions by the board for the traffic? <coughs> Mr. Hudson? Uh, yes, thank you. There's 
been some various testimony or assertions that your trip generation didn't include the aggregate being delivered to the production facility. Is that is that a fair characterization? I mean, how would you? So the ITE data is um, it's traffic counts collected at existing driveways at existing facilities all over the country, and so you, us traffic engineers, whenever we're counting an existing facility. We then provide that information to ITE, and they include it within their database, and that's how they're able to develop these different trip rates. You know, back in the 70s and 80s, they had data from there, and then they were able to get rid of them and use the more recent information. So it's really all about us as traffic engineers being able to provide that information. So as far as any kind of counts going in and out of the facility, those are all contained within that database. Mr. Hudson, is that? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, I think I, I understand what he's saying, but um, it's something that I'll talk with Mr. Husband about just to make sure that we're comfortable with that because sure. I'm not, you know, as was shown uh, in the video, there's two, two different types of facilities there. That, that one, one of them, the aggregate was on site, so there was no trucking with that. The trips were just generated to the stuff going out the door, so to speak. And then the other one, uh, you know, our, our situation here, and probably there are other sites like that, but all materials have to be trucked in and trucked out, and so mm -hmm. that's a little different. So I just want to go back and uh, review what you've submitted on that part of it. Sure. Um, so Not a problem. Yeah. Thanks. Other questions by the board for the traffic engineer? Okay. Thank you. We're all set. All right. Uh, Mr. Perlman, you had a second piece of the presentation. Yes, again, um, Dr. Laura Green is here. Dr. Laura Green is here to address uh, the uh, air quality issues and uh, some concerns that were raised at the last hearing. All right, thank you. Good evening, I'm Laura Green. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, thank you again for the honor to speak with you. I want to give you a quick update and then maybe just a couple of quick responses to um, some of the technical comments made before. Um, I'll try to be brief. Um, last time I told you that I did not consider explicitly the impact from uh, emissions from the tailpipes of the heavy, heavy duty trucks. I didn't do it. Uh, no one does it on these kinds of facilities, but I said I'd do it and so I did. Um, as you may know, there are two pollutants that would be the major pollutants of concern from diesel engine trucks. The first are nitrogen oxides. As you know, nitrogen is the primary uh, gas in ambient air. About 78% of air is nitrogen. And so when you burn anything, whether it's gasoline, diesel fuel, uh, wood in your fireplace, fuel in your home heating system, anything that burns, any material that burns, is going to generate oxides of nitrogen because of the way our atmosphere uh, is uh, is comprised of. It's mostly nitrogen. So nitrogen oxides are the main pollutant out of anything, any exhaust system that's uh, operating on any fuels, fossil fuels, wood, etc. The second pollutant of potential concern um, is called particulate matter. It's the little aerosols um, that you usually can't see, but they are there. Um, diesel engines, just like gasoline engines, uh, just like fireplaces, uh, also generate little aerosols and little <coughs> particles. Of those two pollutants, as I said, nitrogen oxides will be the primary one. So what I did with the help of colleagues um, from Jason's office, um, I uh, determined uh, maximum emissions of nitrogen oxides from, I assumed, 200 trucks, essentially constantly on the site during all operating hours, every operating hour, every day that they're open, for every week of the year. So it's a reasonably worst case scenario, I believe. And the reason I consider the on-site um, truck emissions is if you think about it, that's the site of maximum impact, right? That's where most of the trucks are gonna be. It's not at an intersection. It's not anywhere distant from the site. It's on the site itself. And as we all know, there are people living pretty close to the site either currently in the existing two and three story buildings or potentially in the future at the Henry Hanger building. 
So it was very important to me to continue to focus on the site, right, in terms of emissions, whether it's from the facility itself or from the trucks. So I made a number of assumptions. I assumed, for example, that there would be some trucks in line in the morning waiting to get hot mix product or warm mix product uh, delivered to them under a silo. There'd be four or five trucks in line on the paved part of the roadway, on the, on the site, paved part of the site where the trucks enter. After about five or so trucks, if a sixth truck comes along and there's not room on that paved roadway, then that truck would be directed to an on-site parking area along Temple, the railroad along Temple Street, and that truck would park. It would idle for five minutes or so, and then depending on whether it was only the sixth truck or the 16th truck, in a worst case scenario, eventually it would turn off its engine. So I considered both uh, emissions during truck idling, and then if a truck were there for let's say 15 minutes, it might well turn its engine off, but then of course it would start it up. And as you might know instinctively, emissions from a startup, from a essentially cold state, are different from idling emissions, right? So I had, again, um, using Jason's colleagues' uh, expertise with running US EPA models, I got from Jason's firm two kinds of emission rates. Emission rates for idling trucks and emission rates for trucks that were starting up after having parked for, let's say, 10 minutes or so. So if you're following my scenario, I put a maximum number of trucks on the site in the morning from when the facility opened to about 90 minutes later, I considered that a maximum time frame. And then throughout the day, I put the other trucks on the site so that again, I had a total of 200 trucks on the facility over the entire framework, of the entire workday, okay? And when I did that, here are the results I got. For nitrogen oxides, I got impacts that were larger than obviously impacts if it were, there were just one or two trucks, right? But the maximum impact was still well within health-based limits. And as you may know, under the National Ambient Air Quality Standard, there are different time frames. The federal government wants us to make certain that air quality is appropriately clean, both on a very short-term basis, so we average things over the worst case hour which as I've discussed would be the early morning hours when lots of trucks are coming in potentially and also when air quality is um, a little challenging because very early in the morning, I'm sure you've all experienced this, very early morning hours, air tends to be still, there's not a lot of sunlight yet, therefore there's not a lot of convection of air, so there's not a lot of dispersion. So the early morning hours can be worst case. So I focused on that for the one hour short-term impact. And I found that even at the very closest residence, right over the railroad track, either an existing residence on that right over the railroad track or the hangar building, at the very closest residence, at the very worst hour, and I take a year's worth of data, the facility, the truck impacts would still be acceptably small. So that was an important finding. Then I did the same analysis averaging over a year because there are also um, standards and guidelines that look at uh, health-based limits over the long term, right? So both the long-term impact for nitrogen oxides and the very short-term impact, again, at the closest residence, and it's very, very important. I mean, of course people live there, and of course people live within a quarter mile and a half a mile. But my job is to make certain that the person who lives there the closest who might be an asthmatic, might be a child, might be an elderly person, might be someone with cardiac insufficiency. My job is to make certain that the closest person is protected. And by definition, if the closest person is protected, then obviously so are people farther afield. It's a very important point. Okay, second, diesel engine exhaust particulate matter. I told you last time that the reason I didn't do the formal modeling, or at least I may have told you, what I was thinking anyway, is that I didn't do the formal modeling because trucks have come a long way. And with um, two important changes, um, truck fuel, diesel engine, diesel fuel 
with the exception of fuel for barges and ships at sea. But the kind of diesel fuel that trucks operate on now is called ultra-low sulfur diesel fuel. Virtually all of the sulfur, not all, most of the sulfur is stripped away at the refinery long before it gets to a diesel pump at a station. So scientists like me know that when we model diesel engine exhaust particulate matter emissions with today's ultra-low sulfur diesel fuel, <laughs> I guess I'm over my limit. Um, and I should say the, the aerosols that used to come out a lot were sulfur-based. They were sulfates. So we know just because we do this kind of thing for a living that the diesel engine exhaust particulate matter emissions are very low these days and are getting lower still, both because of mandated, US EPA mandated, federally mandated reductions in the amount of sulfur in fuel which necessarily reduces the amount of sulfates, which are particles. That's the first important change, thanks to the feds. And the second important change is that diesel, dieselized trucks now have filters and other kinds of pollution control that even 10 years ago they didn't have, let alone you know, when you and I were young. So those two factors mean that the result that I knew I would get is frankly the result I got. So here's the number. The, um, impact from the worst case trucks, which again I average out over, in this case, an annual period. Because if diesel engine exhaust is going to be harmful, it's not harmful immediately. It's going to be a long-term exposure. So the long-term average from the truck scenario that I've discussed, the impact, the worst case year out of five years of data, the worst case year is 0.003 micrograms of diesel engine exhaust particulate matter per cubic meter of air. 0.003, and then the next question is, okay, what's the safe limit? The safe limit is five. Five micrograms per cubic meter is what toxicologists like me who work for the federal government have established as the safe level for diesel engine exhaust particulate matter in ambient air for a 70-year lifetime, day in and day out. So five is the health-based standard, and the worst case impact is 0 0.003. So I didn't do the modeling before. I apologize for that. I kind of knew what the answer would be, because I've done this for decades. But you all deserve the numbers, and there they are. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions about that, or maybe just to talk about a couple of things that came up in the last hour. It's up to you. OK, thanks. Um, I just have a couple quick questions. Um, regarding the health-based limits, um, does, in your experience, have those changed over time? Sure, they get tighter. And, and what's the scale of the change, say, over the last 20 years? Uh, you know, excellent mean, question. Maybe you don't know it off the top of your head. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. excellent question. Okay, um, for nitrogen oxides, mm -hmm. up until about a dozen years ago, there was no one-hour standard at all. The feds just didn't bother with it. They only looked at a long-term average, so there was literally no number at all. And now there is a number for the one-hour impact, which I think was an important um, development, actually. So 12 years ago or so, it didn't exist, and now it does. Um, with diesel engine exhaust particulate matter, there have been numbers. Um, the only really comparable numbers, frankly, are occupational standards for men who work in underground mines where there's dieselized equipment, right? Because if you think about it, the worst case exposure will be men, sometimes women, but it's usually men, who are in mines and there are, you know, diesel powered things, you know, I don't know, front end loaders, whatever, kind of scurrying around in a mine. So there are occupational standards which are um, much, much less strict. And when the environmental toxicologists um, worked to develop an allowable standard for ordinary people, you know, the elderly, 
you know, the infirm, et cetera, they started with the occupational standard, which is quite lenient, and then applied a number of safety factors to account for the fact that people in a community are not minors. And so the number that was developed of five micrograms of diesel engine exhaust particulate matter per cubic meter of air, I don't actually know how old that standard is, but I know that it comes with a lot of safety factors built in based on um, what occupational toxicologists have observed about minors who are overexposed to diesel engine exhaust. So if you follow what I'm saying, and I'm sorry I'm being so wordy, we, we in the scientific community have a lot of experience about the worst case exposures, those underground minors, and occupational toxicologists develop standards that protect those highly exposed men, and then other toxicologists working at the Environmental Protection Agency have reduced that standard quite considerably to get to an allowable level for the general population. And, and that has stood the test of time. To my knowledge, uh, there's never been a different number for the general public than that five microgram per cubic meter number, to my knowledge. Okay, thank you. Um, other questions by the board for Alderman Thibault? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so my question is, and maybe this is stupid, I don't know. Um, no stupid questions. So, you know, kids are walking by these diesel engines, and they're shorter than people, right? So the adults. So, you know. I don't know. I'm pretty short, but yes, I get your point. They're yeah, shorter than that, even, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. right? Real sure. short. They're closer so, to the ground. They're closer to getting that, that diesel, mm, smelling it. No, they're no? not. It's not a stupid question, but I think you haven't looked at a truck lately. Those well, exhaust the pipes day, are. Right? Uh, they're about, the exhaust pipes are about 10 feet, uh, well, actually, construction guys, it's about 10 feet off the ground. Okay. I mean, I don't know about your, tr I mean, really? You know, think about it. Okay. Uh, so let me ask not, you this. They're not at the. Sure. You're thinking, I think you're thinking, if I can say. Yeah. You're thinking about the tailpipes of cars. Yeah, okay. That, I'll give you that. Um, okay. That's like a foot off the ground, maybe. So you're saying it, all this is safe. Right? That's what your report is showing. I'm telling you that actually, you know, a basketball player is going to get a higher exposure to a diesel exhaust than a toddler. We'll get some tall kids around here. Um, yeah, it's 10 feet high. So let me put it this way. So would you live next to this plant and yeah. feel safe? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, that's the whole point of doing the exercise. I mean, I am 69 years old. I'm, so I'm elderly, I'm reasonably healthy, so I'm not the person I worry about. I mean, yeah, I'm not the person I worry about. It's safe for me. It's safe for people who are more vulnerable than me. Okay. Uh, other questions by the board? Ms. Harper? Yeah. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Could you Tell us a little bit more about um, the VOCs that are produced from a, a, a drum plant versus like a batch uh, plant. I'm not an expert, obviously, about any of this, but I've been reading a little bit and it seems like those vary quite a bit between those two types of plants. Uh, yeah, good question. Um, yes, so VOCs are volatile organic compounds. There are thousands of them in the world. <laughs> um, the ones that we, fo so the two that we focused on because Dr. Zemba actually was interested in them in one of his early letters, benzene and formaldehyde are both volatile organic compounds. So are um, toluene, xylene, there are lots of them. You are quite right that um, the uh, levels of volatile organic compounds that come out of drum plants differ from the ones that come out of batch plants, but they vary in, in different ways. What turns out to be more important, frankly, is the type of fuel that's being burned. Mm -hmm. So actually the important distinction is not so much between a counterflow drum plant, which is more efficient. I mean, these, the counterflow drum plants are more efficient and they, as a very general matter, are less polluting than batch plants. But the other important factor is whether the fuel that's being burned is natural gas, which is the cleanest fossil fuel, or uh, diesel fuel, or number, or spec fuel, which is kind of used motor oil kind of stuff. Um, some plants actually burn coal, believe it or not. 
So the, I know it's pretty weird, right? Um, I mean, not in New England, but actually in the Midwest, there's still some coal burning asphalt plants and in other countries, of course. Um, so it, it's really the fuel that matters most in my experience, not, you know, the drum plant is a better facility than a batch plant, but it's the fuel that's also important. Can I have a follow up? Sure, question? go ahead. I, I did notice that, that that is important when I was looking into that. Um, and then my, I guess my other question was about the PMs that also those seem to be a little more, you know, based if the batch plant made 100,000 tons of asphalt and the drum plant made 200,000 um, tons, it, it actually had triple the amount of PMs than the batch plant. Is, is that accurate? I don't know. Um, I haven't thought about that way, but I mean, as a general matter, the more of anything you make, the more emissions you're going to have. Right. It wasn't double, though. It was triple. Yeah. I like. don't know whether that's, if you say so, I'm happy to agree, but <laughs> I, I have not actually done that side-by-side -side comparison, so I'm sorry I can't answer you. No, that's okay. Thank, thank you. Sure. Other questions by the board? Uh, um, she said that, I'm sorry. Yeah. She said that she had some other information to, re, re, I guess, uh, oh. debate some of the, the information that was said earlier. I'd, I'd like to hear that. Sure. Yeah, go ahead if oh, you have okay. any. okay. Yeah. yeah, I just want to mention a couple quick things. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'd forgotten. <laughs> 69 years old. Um, okay, a couple things. Let's see. Professor Durant, who's a very um, respected guy. I don't know if he's still here. No, he's not there. Well. <laughs> I wasted a compliment. Professor Durant is a very respected guy, um, but with respect, he didn't actually look at my report. Um, first of all, it's not true that I didn't present Winrose information. Of course I did. It's all in a spreadsheet. So that's just not true, and I think Professor Durant just didn't have time to look. So obviously I know that the wind comes from the northwest and goes to the southeast in a major way. I mean, that's how I do the modeling. So. I was a little surprised by that. Um, number two, Pro Professor Durant is completely correct that bag houses, which is the major pollution control device here, capture particles, little aerosols and little particles, and they don't capture gases. But that is, of course, true, and my modeling is based on that truth. So I just thought that was both true and, frankly, a little misleading. It kind of suggested that maybe there was a pollution device that the facility should have that it doesn't. I mean, you can't capture gases, right? I'm making gas right now. I mean, what are you going to do about it? So it's, it's true that the gases come out of anything, and it's also true that people like me take that very seriously and model it. Um, and then I think the final thing I wanted to say is that um, I, with regard to Dr. Walker, I, I don't understand. And, and you asked the question, actually. Um, I don't understand how she could have looked at my spreadsheet, which has, I mean, <laughs> many, many, many chemicals. Every chemical that has ever been measured, ever been measured, out of a hot mix asphalt plant is in my spreadsheet. And every single one of those chemicals is run through the model, and every single one I have looked at impacts from. So how she could have missed that is beyond me. And I went to check, by the way, your staff is very good. Like, within a day or two of your staff getting my report, my spreadsheet, and all the other documents, Jason's documents, all the rest of that, within a day or two, it's up on your spreadsheet. It's up, I'm sorry, it's up on your website. It was up on your website on March 23rd, at least, is I think when I looked at it. Okay, both the original electronic version and, oddly enough, a scanned in printed out version. Don't understand that part. But in any event, I mean, you guys are presenting all the information to everyone to review. And the fact that highly skilled technical people write reports to you that don't refer to things that are on your own website, I think is a waste of everybody's time and greatly disappointing to me. I mean, I thought at first maybe it wasn't there, but I went and checked. Your staff put it up there, and it's been up there since March. So. Just wanted to both commend your staff and say that I'm a little confused as to why it wasn't obvious to either Professor Durant or Dr. Walker. 
All right. Uh, any other, just quickly, any other questions by the board? Or? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Perlman. Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, um, again, Andy Perlman, just very quickly. If I could um, just quickly speak to the request for our continuance. Yep. Our, friend, our friend Bob Simons uh, from SMC um, spoke about how are we going to be accountable um, in going forward with this asphalt plant over the years that in operations. Very good point. Yesterday, uh, Mr. Durfee issued a memo, and in the memo, he suggested perhaps there's some type of performance bond that could be posted by the applicant um, <coughs> that can test uh, air quality and other concerns and make sure that the um, Newport Constructions asphalt plant is working the way it should be. We are agreeable to that. We are agreeable to posting a performance bond. Maybe there's an annual testing. Maybe it's a certain dollar amount every year. Uh, but we request a continuance so we can work those issues through. We just heard it for the first time yesterday. We think it's a good idea. but. Uh, we need some time to sit down with Mr. Durfee and the whole team and, and figure out what those numbers would be and what type of testing. So we're happy to do that. We just need some time to address those issues. Okay. So th thank you. All right. So I just want to be specific with respect to some continuance um, thoughts. And um, while I still have you here, and I'd like to to talk about a few options um, and get your feedback before somebody up here tries to make a motion or something. So um, I'm th thinking out loud that um, there's a reasonably significant amount of stuff to, to kind of relook at, understanding what the board has received in you having received the same stuff. Um, so our meeting schedule as it comes up, there's one on the May, May 4th and one on May 18th. Um, the process for, you know, continuing evaluating more information and then giving sort of members from the public and anybody else a chance to review what you resubmit um, and get back their comments to the board. Obviously, that's a cycle, and um, we need that cycle to be a finite cycle. Um, because we can't get in a do loop and just keep <laughs> going around the horn forever. So um, I think what I'm <clears throat> thinking about, and I'm interested in your, whether it's, this is consistent with what you're capable of, is, um, is something along the lines of a, a continuance to the May 18th um, meeting, um, which essentially gives, um, several weeks here, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, that's seven weeks um, that are available. So what I would like to propose or, or ask of you is, is would you be able to get your, um, your information back to this board by three weeks, the 27th? Um, of April, and I'm going to then propose to the board anyway, and this is going to be all, obviously all up to the board, that, um, that any information that anybody else wants to get back to us, whether that's abutters, public, representatives of others, gets back to the board by the 11th, so that gives two weeks of review of your information by people out in the world, um, but that still gives the board essentially two weeks to review your information and at least a week to review what we get from the public. So that seems like a reasonable concept to me that gets us out of any kind of do loops here. Um, is, is the 27th something, does that seem reasonable for the amount of information that you're intending to review and provide additional? Info on there. And honestly, I think it's going to be tight. Matt, Matt I suggest that mm -hmm. the applicant have a deadline of May 4th, two weeks prior to the hearing, and then uh, public can um, submit by the same May 11th. And we could make that work. Yeah, I mean, the board can figure out the public part, frankly. Sure. Um, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, and, and we can, obviously, this is just 
a suggestion I'm going to ask the board make the decision and talk about it um, anyway um, so does anybody from the board have any want to add anything to what I'm talking about before we yeah I, I guess the only thing I would add is you know we're talking about the deadlines and understanding that it's you know one week before two weeks before but May 4th I mean it doesn't necessarily have to be a what would otherwise be a sort of a meeting date so what Correct. what is yeah. you know are you are you suggesting May 4th just because that's two weeks before I mean could it be May 1st for example just thinking about sort of arranging the the time in between when you would submit and <laughs> and when the public would have a, a chance to I mean May, May 1st would be fine I'm, I'm just I'm just trying to buy some time for our client you know for, for example the BB and G appraisal is a very long appraisal it took months to prepare yeah. um, so we need some time uh, to, to respond to that May 1st uh, you know we'll make it happen okay yeah and I think that still gives you know one two three four five Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eight, nine, ten. So still like almost two weeks for public. So, um, sure. I think that will, all right. So I, I'm just interested in getting that input. I mean, the board will make these decisions, but um, all right. Um, anything else for us at this Thank point? you very much. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, um, so at this point, I'm going to, um, you know, We've been requested of a continuance, so I think it's it's worth um, the board considering that. And um, should we technically? I think we technically we we'll close the public yeah. So hearing I'll, I'll close the public hearing as a technical matter at this point and move into a public meeting for the purpose of reviewing this continuance. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on these? You know, I, I think it's very important that we set the cut of the dates because we've been down this road before and we we get in these pretty continuous loops if we don't do that. So, thoughts for the board? Go ahead, Mr. Hudson. Y yes, I agree. I think, uh, in, a, in addition, I think there should be a uh, uh, shut off date for any response comments. Like, uh, you know, to Mr. Bollinger's point in previous meetings, I don't want to get new information the night before the meeting. Yeah, that's what I was the, thinking the, about like on the, the Friday uh, before the, call the, it the, the 11th, which is the week out. But we could do the Friday, yeah, that gives another day. So, like that, yeah. in this scenario, based on the 18th, that would be like the 12th. Yeah. You know, which. You know, I, again, I think that's a pretty reasonable. Because there's a, there's a lot there's a lot of information obviously, and th that's already been submitted. And there'll be more submitted, so the yeah, I think the board needs the benefit of uh, you know almost a week anyway to go through and really yeah make sure we've us had <coughs> full opportunity. One, and then two. the other kind of procedural Five. question I would ask. I yep. Uh, case A twenty one dash O three zero two wasn't that re wasn't that removed by the applicant or? That's for staff, but I think so, right? Rescinded by the applicant or something to that effect. I just, as we're moving to uh, table these things, I want to make sure we have the, the yes. items correct. I think the three lot subdivision is now a two lot subdivision. That's correct, yep. Um, and that, that other case, has that been disposed of or do we need to dispose of it? The applicant has requested to withdraw that case. The agenda so, okay. will be This is 0302? Yes. Okay. So we don't necessarily need to continue that. No, it doesn't exist. It just won't be on the next board. agenda. Yeah. 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 Okay. So it's really uh, 0299, 0300, and 0301. This is really the three. Okay. Yeah. Other discussions on this matter and on the board? All right. Somebody want to make a motion regarding this? Mr. Marley? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Based on the discussion we've just had, I would make a motion to continue uh, old business subdivision plans A21 0299 and old business site plans A21 0300 and A21 0301 to the May 18th, 2023 meeting of the planning board with the following understandings uh, regarding submissions that. Uh, all submissions of the applicant um, will be uh, 
or, or all materials from the applicant will be submitted by May 1st, 2023, and that any responses from members of the public or uh, other parties to those submissions will be made by May 12th, 2023. Okay, so we have that motion for that continuance with that information regarding the schedule of submissions and responses by Mr. Varley. Do we have a second? Second by Mr. Hudson. Any further discussion by the board? Mr. Hudson? Uh, yeah, I would just say uh, we want to give the applicant full benefit of whatever time they need. So should they, in developing responses, find that May 1st doesn't work for them and they need some more time, certainly we could table to a, a meeting later than May 18th. But if, if the target is the May 18th meeting, I think this is the appropriate timeline. Okay. Yep. Agreed. Other discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, that mo motion passes. Thank you very much. Okay. All right, we have a few other things on our agenda here. I'd ask the public if anybody, that you're obviously willing to, you're more than welcome to stay, but if you want to head out, we'll give you a couple minutes here to, uh, um, I'm actually going to, I'm going to put us in recess for five minutes here. So it's 9.01, we'll come back at 9.06. Yeah, Dan. 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 Dan.
Okay, uh, we're gonna move back into session here. So um, next up on the agenda, we have uh, new business conditional special use permit. This is case number A23-00. 22, uh, Micro Society Academy Charter School and Maverick Properties, New Hampshire, LLC owners. This is an application and acceptance of proposed conditional use permit to convert the existing office building at 589 West Hollis Street to a school. Uh, again, this property is located at 589 and 591 West Hollis Street. So with respect to the application, um, some folks on the board, has anybody had a chance to take a look at this? Application, want to make a motion as to whether it's ready for us to take jurisdiction? Anyway. Go ahead, Mr. Hirsch. I move to take jurisdiction. Okay. okay. All right, so we have a motion to take jurisdiction by Mr. Hirsch. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Ms. Harper. Any further discussion on the jurisdiction by the board? I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Just a question: yep. Are we gonna, are we looking at both cases at the same time, or just? Oh, um, good point. Yes, we should. Um, we would hear this along with new business site plan case number eight twenty three dash zero zero two one, and I will. I, I guess um, we'll we'll take them separately. And since I already started okay. the second on the on the conditional special use permit. So with respect to the conditional use permit, um, we have a first and a second, or a motion and a second. Um, so all those in favor of that motion? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. That motion passes. So regarding uh, case 823-0021, this is the uh, same owner, application and acceptance of proposed amendment to NR 1454 to convert the existing office building at 589 West Hall Street to a school along with associated site improvements. Um, do we have any, has anybody had a chance to take a look at that site plan application? Want to make a motion as to whether it's ready for us to take jurisdiction? Anybody? Ms. Harbour? Uh, yes, I'd like to make a motion that A23-0021 is ready for us to take jurisdiction. Dur jurisdiction. Okay, so we have a motion to take jurisdiction on A23-0021. Do we have a second? Second by Mr. Hirsch. Any further discussion by the board? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. That motion passes. Okay, so we've got them both in jurisdiction. And uh, we can go ahead and hear from the applicant. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the planning board. For the record, my name is Tom Zajak. I'm a civil engineer with Hainer Swanson, 3 Congress Street here in Nashua. Uh, with me here tonight is attorney Morgan Hollis, Gottesman and Hollis, uh, along with three members of the Micro Society Academy Charter School. Uh, Barbara Haletti is here in person, and we have uh, Amy Bottomley and Tom Doherty on Zoom with us tonight. We're here seeking a site plan and conditional use permit approval for uh, what is essentially a change of use of the existing 589 West Hollis building and site from an office building uh, to a school use along with associated site improvements. Um, I know many members of the board were here a year ago when we came in with a, a modular project. Um, so I just got a brief presentation to kind of walk through various aspects of this site plan, uh, after which I'd be happy to answer any questions or kind of delve into the details a little bit more. Okay. Linda, do you mind bringing up the plan? So as noted, uh, the project uh, is 589 and 591 West Hollis, two lots, map E, lot six, and uh, 1494. Uh, in total, they total a little over four acres. Uh, they are split zoned. Uh, majority is R9. Uh, the 589 West Hollis Street building, the current commercial office, is a split zoned, uh, with the east, uh, easterly portion of the site being a park industrial. Um, as you know, this site is predominantly abutted by residential uses, uh, with the exception of the city-owned land, uh, Stello Stadium, Natural YMCA, uh, to the north, along with a self-storage facility to the south. The site contains about 800 feet of frontage on West Hollis Street. Uh, dating back to the 70s, it's been used for both commercial office and medical office. Uh, the existing site is fully developed with buildings, pavement, and lawn area. The 591 West Hollis Street property contains an existing two-story, approximately 17,000 square foot building, 
along with the separate modular building uh, occupied by the Micro Society Academy Charter School. The modular itself was something that we permitted before this board last year. Uh, the school has been at the site since 2014. Um, they are a New Hampshire chartered public school with a current enrollment of about 300 students, grades K through 8, uh, 28 uh, teachers and staff. Typical hours of operation, Monday through Friday, uh, 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, with occasional nighttime activities. Uh, the school has an agreement to purchase uh, the adjacent site, as I mentioned, 589 West Hollis Street, which currently contains an existing two-story building, roughly 20,000 square feet. Uh, access to the site, as you can see on the site plan up before you. Uh, current access to the site is provided via, via a main uh, shared driveway in the central portion of the site. There is also a, a secondary entrance along the westerly portion of the site, uh, which is roped off and is really only used for entering bus traffic during uh, peak morning uh, drop-off and afternoon uh, pickup times. In total, the site contains uh, 156 parking spaces and is about 30% uh, open space uh, between the two sites. Uh, relatively flat topography and, of course, uh, serviced by public sewer, water, gas, overhead, and underground electric and telecommunication utilities. So the proposed project is fairly straightforward. Uh, first, we're proposing to renovate the existing 589 West Hollis Street building from an office use to a school. Uh, this is envisioned to uh, house the, the middle school program moving forward. Uh, as part of the project, the existing uh, two classroom modular building, which was constructed last summer, uh, will be removed from the site. Uh, no changes are proposed to the existing school building, the 591 West Hollis Street building which will be used for the lower uh, grades. The two lots will be merged as part of this process, and upon completion, uh, the school will be able to grow uh, to a total of about 432 students and 40 employees or staff. This is uh, about 132 students and 12 uh, staff added. Uh, associated site improvements. So uh, we worked uh, pretty hard to take a look at what we could do within the school's budget to enhance uh, both vehicular and pedestrian safety. Uh, the, big, the big improvement we're making is relocating uh, the existing shared driveway. So right now this shared driveway is offset about 60 feet from Gendron Street, which is the residential street across. Um, this has been an existing condition for many years, dating back to when uh, the medical office and office building dominated the site. Uh, as you know, the traffic on West Hollis Street only continues uh, to grow. Uh, the school has done a great job of mitigating that existing condition. Um, but in uh, reviewing this uh, request to add, uh, to do the change of use and add these additional students and talking with uh, Mr. Hudson and uh, city staff, uh, the request was made to, to go ahead and formalize that and, and relocate that driveway to line it up with Gendron Street, which really uh, creates a true four-way intersection with uh, West Hollis Street, Gendron Street, and the site driveway. So the new driveway will include one inbound lane and two outbound lanes along with a, a curbed uh, a median in the middle. Uh, in terms of site modifications, we're working to establish a, a new one-way traffic pattern on site. Uh, this includes the elimination of, of about 50 existing parking spaces, uh, creation of, of two areas for dedicated bus lanes, uh, enhanced islands, signage, pavement markings, along with sidewalks and crosswalks. So we're really trying to do all we can in working with the existing site to really maximize safety for you know, parents and students during those peak times. Um, as a result of the project, we'll, we'll end up with a, a slight reduction in impervious area, about 2% across the site. And we're not proposing any new lighting landscape or any utility improvements as part of the project. Um, I did want to speak briefly to, to traffic um, based on our, our uh, application about a year ago. That was really the biggest topic that we discussed. Um, so I'll just kind of go through the particulars a little bit. Uh, we did actually have two traffic studies that were submitted for this project. Uh, Steve Pernaw prepared uh, an initial st uh, trip generation analysis in traffic report, we were just talking about ITE versus actual counts, and, and I'll kind of go through that in a second. 
Um, we also had a supplemental traffic study uh, by Van Ness and Associates uh, dated March 28th. Um, so for the site, there's a DOT traffic counter located just west of the site. West Hollow Street uh, carries about uh, 13 to 15,000 vehicles pull per day along this stretch. So it's a fairly heavy use corridor. Uh, as with most uh, co commuter or arterial roads, the peak times are 7 to 8 and then 8 to 9 in the morning, 4 to 5 and 5 to 6 in the afternoon. Uh, the school's peak times uh, uh, are slightly off from that in the morning. It, it will line up a little bit better. The main drop-off time uh, occurs in about a half hour window in the morning, about 8.30 to 9 o'clock. Um, and then in the afternoon, about 3.30 to 4. So we're just before that afternoon peak. Uh, we worked uh, extensively with uh, Mr. Hudson, uh, Mr. Husband and staff uh, as it relates to uh, improving trafty, uh, traffic safety and turning movements throughout the site. Uh, as I mentioned during a scoping meeting, it was, it was requested that as part of this project, we relocate that site driveway. Uh, there are a number of uh, conflicting turning movements that are uh, the result of the offset driveway that exists out there now. Uh, so those uh, should be remedied. Um, we did look at both ITE manual trip rates along with actual traffic counts from the site driveway and the adjacent Wellesley Road, uh, West Hollow Street intersection. It's important to note that the actual traffic counts measured during the peak hours were about 30 to 40 percent less than the ITE manual rates, uh, likely due to the high number of students that take the bus. And if you remember back to our case uh, a year ago, we actually were saying that, that we, we felt we had a high uh, bus rate and the ITE trip generation was a little bit conservative. So it was good to see those numbers proved out. Uh, with the uh, actual traffic data, we're, we've got 56 additional trips during the AM peak hour, 49 additional trips during the school's weekday peak hour, uh, and then 15 fewer trips during the weekday PM peak hour. Again, the school's peak is slightly before the roadway peak. We're also getting rid of that uh, 20,000 square feet of commercial office use. So that's a reason for the slight reduction in, in PM peak hours. Um, additionally, as part of the project, there'll be a new eastbound left turn lane that will be added at the site driveway. Uh, which will help uh, vehicles turning into the site from West Hollow Street. And in totality, we believe these improvements will, will certainly result in a significant improvement, not only for the school, but also for the overall corridor. Um, Mr. Chair, we uh, did submit a waiver request letter dated March 28th, 2023. Uh, three site plan waivers. I'd ask that that uh, letter be incorporated into the record by reference. Uh, the first waiver was for maximum number of parking spaces. Uh, we're reducing by about 50. That's out there now. Um, there's only 44 that would be required by code. I think it's per classroom. Uh, so we feel we, we're providing about 100 spaces. We feel like that's a good number for the school, especially during those peak, you know, well, once a year nighttime events. Uh, second waiver is related to the maximum driveway width. There is a 36 foot maximum width. As I talked about, we worked with engineering on kind of coming up with a, a solution for the driveway. So what we came up with, which includes the medium, is, is 50 feet wide. So we are exceeding that driveway width. And the third is for the fairly standard existing conditions plan on a budding property. We've provided full survey for this site, uh, just not for a budding site. So those are our three waiver requests. I'd be happy to speak to each in, in, in more detail, but again, I would uh, point you to our waiver request letter. Um, in addition, we've got the conditional use permit. So schools are allowed by conditional use within the R9 zone. I did submit a letter dated February 22nd, 2023. Um, again, I'd ask that it be uh, uh, incorporated into the record by reference. We certainly believe that this project meets all uh, nine conditional use uh, permit approval criteria. Uh, so in summary, we believe the application is complete and conforms with the applicable site plan and conditional use permit requirements. Uh, the additional classroom space will allow for the school to accommodate their growing list of students and families they seek to serve. Uh, the addition of the second building will allow the school to remove the temporary modular building from the site and to improve and expand upon the quality of education that they're providing uh, in a more permanent and long-term manner. Uh, I'd like to thank staff for working with us over the last month or so in uh, getting us to this point. And uh, we did read through the conditions of approval 
uh, and those are acceptable with the possible noted elimination of uh, condition number five. I'm not sure if that made it to the final report. Um, it did not, but it, it's okay with staff to delete that. It was related to open space, and there's been some uh, updated communication there. So, uh, and that's all I had for my formal presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thanks. Um, is there any any architectural changes to the medical office building proposed? No exterior changes. Nothing at this point. I assume it might be some signage of some sort. Uh, so the yeah, yeah the only signage which if you go out there right now there's a yeah. the 589 sign on the right side the 591. Well we're moving the driveway which will impact the school sign and so we're just going to move it over to where the the 589 ground sign is out front. Um, okay. All I'm right. not aware of any other facade changes to the building. All right. And then, I don't know, maybe this is Mr. Hudson, too, can comment. I mean, I know there's plans for corridor studies here, and, and I don't know how far along any have been, but um, is the configuration of the new entrance consistent with the thinking of what may go on? In the I'm just wondering. You know, if there's ever corridor widening or something, is this entrance such that any kind of widening there would cause a significant, or is it, could it be cut back and it doesn't really affect the rest of the site? Thoughts? <clears throat> um, so the status of the corridor study is it, yeah. it's just get, going to be getting started soon. Yeah. We've been waiting for spring to do traffic counts so that we can count pedestrians as well as. Uh, you know, bicyclists and pedestrians as well as vehicles. Yeah. Um, so that study's getting ready to kick off. Um, I think what I'd like to do is ask, uh, when, if this is a good time or later, ask um, senior traffic engineer Wayne Husband to come up and he can just talk uh, through kind of the things we're thinking about in this area. Yeah. Um, there's, there's some ideas we have that we're, we're going to have to study as part of the corridor study. But this uh, realignment of the driveway kind of sets us up for it so that, so that we see that as very positive step so okay good yeah this is a good time for mr husband that would be great good evening uh wayne husband senior traffic engineer city of nashua um yes the uh, west hall street traffic uh, corridor study is something that we very much had in mind as we were looking at this site because the uh some of the difficulties that we've had um, in the past um, concerning like, uh, you know, traffic safety and so forth in this area. And we've long wanted to try to do something to improve the situation for the school and for the, the people driving on West Hollow Street. So, you know, we've looked at things like, can we tie into the, the, the right of way over behind the office building to get it into Stello Stadium and ultimately out to the uh, Riverside intersection. That never really bore any fruit. We would have loved to have tied the school's access back and back of the, some of that residential into Wellesley Street where we could bring it out to the traffic signal and that would get rid of a lot of the problems as well. But I don't, that, I think that's gonna be too expensive a proposition. I don't think anyone's gonna wanna move, so. But as part of, the, as part of this, what we're doing is we're, we're looking at ways that we could set ourselves up for that West Hollis Street corridor improvement study. And the school's been very cooperative in that regard. Moving the site entrance directly across from Gendron just opens up a lot of possibilities for us with our future improvements, and we don't have to worry about that offset. Right. So that's good. Um, we're also looking at the possibility of um, expanding the traffic signal at Ledgewood and Wellesley such that we, would, we might be able to tie the school and Gendron's entrance into the same traffic controller that controls Wellesley and Ledgewood and time the signal such that, uh, you know, you, you, you could have those two intersections working together and allowing the West Hollow Street traffic to flow. Um, there's some work that would need to be done to get that done, but so we're looking at ways or we're going to be looking as part of this process to also, if we need any easements for such as conduit across their driveway for underground conduit for that future traffic signal, now's the time to get it 
so we don't have to rip up the driveway again when we come down with, say, a signalized improvement through there. And we're going to need a traffic control box somewhere, and I think that the utility poles are on the school side, so we might need an easement for a traffic control box. So we're looking at all that kind of stuff and trying to get the easements as part of this process now. And I'd have to say that the project team has been very cooperative, cooperative with us because I, I think that they see the benefits from a safety perspective as well as we do. And okay. We're looking at other things too, but that's one of the options that we're looking at right now. I mean, it may be a candidate along West Hollow Street to maybe put some roundabouts where people can, you have all right turns at intersections as opposed to, you know, we're looking at all that stuff as part of the West Hollow Street corridor study. I, I, is that the kind of answer? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure this was sort of, there was coordination taking place, right? Oh. So that we weren't improving a plan that was essentially kind of make things more complicated for us. <laughs> you know, the understanding we've been trying to start the corridor thing for a while here. So yeah, I think this. Like uh, my characterization would be this is yeah. a step in the right direction, and uh, yeah. Yeah. and uh, this applicant's probably going a little above and beyond where they probably would, you know, technically have to, and helping us study a couple of these things, mm -hmm. which will help frame um, further study as part of the corridor study. So. Yeah. I echo Wayne's comments. We appreciate um, the coordination we've had with them and what they've been willing to help us do, and um, and I think we're uh, we're close to having what we need to to have those answers. So great. Okay, that's the only question I had. Uh, anybody from the board have any other questions for the applicant? Okay. Uh, at this point, I'll open up anybody in the audience wishing to speak in opposition or concern or. In favor, either? There's not too many people here now, so. <laughs> no? Hey, Mr. Hudson? I did have one question for the applicant, and uh, you know, you look at these things and something else just occurred to me, but. That's fine. Yep. I'm just kind of curious, uh, is there, uh, what would the pedestrian route be should you have a student from the Ledgewood Hills Drive area or West Hollis, you know, that would walk to this school? Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I see a sidewalk connection from West Hollis Street to the school. So maybe that's something that we should uh, add as a consideration. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Rod. So you said from Ledgewood? Say, ledge, from say ledge you wanted to walk from the existing signal uh, into the school. You know, I don't think we have a sidewalk along our pathway along the driveway or whatever. Oh, I, oh that, okay. You know what I'm saying? Correct. So that's something that, you know, I'm sure we can talk about and figure out. But a, a walking route, I don't even know if you have any students in that area, but maybe you would someday. So. Some walking route into the school from the street is probably appropriate. Sure. Okay. Um, all right, I'll go back to the public. Anybody wish to speak in opposition or concern to the plan? Uh, anybody on Zoom? No? I don't see anybody with their hand raised. Okay. Anybody wish to speak in favor? Okay. All right. At this point, I'll ask the board any other questions of the applicant or staff while we're in the hearing? No? Okay. I will go ahead and close the hearing and move into the meeting. So, all right. So we've got, um, yeah, the site's been around a while. It's been in front of us probably. <laughs> I, it's at least a half a dozen times since I've been on the board. But um, it seems to be, to me, to be coming together. Finally, <laughs> it's been in like these disparate pieces with different uses and different owners and different entrances and <laughs> all these different things. And, and to me, this seems like it's starting to gel into a coherent site. Um, so I guess I'm in significant favor of trying to get this going in this direction. But I'm, I welcome anybody else's um, inputs, comments, questions for the board. Mr. Hirsch? Yeah. I, I think it's a great project. I think it's good. You know, you know you'd be taking an office building, which is kind of second, second class, and uh, converting it to an appropriate use. So long term, I think it's a great thing for the city. Yeah. Anybody else? Mr. Hudson? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just glad to see, uh, you know, a plan that removes those modular classrooms. Of course, those are kind of a good, but they're always a stopgap um, type of a measure. So. Um, Seeing this uh, school be able to expand or, uh, to this point that they can remove those, I think, is a positive thing. Yeah. Yeah. Any other comments from the board? 
Anybody want to make a motion here? Um, I remind people we have two applications. Um, the first of which is a conditional use, and I, I think we, we need to take that first to make the second one viable. So, anybody want to make a motion? Mr. Varley? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would make a motion uh, to approve uh, new business conditional use per, uh, permit project A22-0115, Micro Society Academy Charter School owner at 591 West Hollis Street. Um, and that would be with a finding that the plan does meet the requirements outlined in site plan NRO section 190-133F and there are uh, no stipulations or conditions. All right, so we have that motion to approve um, the conditional use permit for this application um, by Mr. Varley. Do we have a second? Second by Mr. Hirsch. Any further discussion by the board? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. That motion <coughs> passes. Um, regarding the site plan, Mr. Riley? Yeah, I'll go ahead and, uh, Mr. Chair, make a motion as to that as well. So again, that would be a motion to approve with respect to new business uh, A23-0021 site plan. Again, Micro Society Academy Charter School is the owner applicant. Um, and this is again, located at 589, 591 West Hollis Street. Um, and that motion will be with the finding that the uh, application does meet the requirements outlined in site plan NRO section 190-146D. Um, and there will be a total of just here, nine stipulations. The first three of those are each waiver request. Um, stipulation number one being a request for a waiver of section 190-198 with respect to maximum number of parking spaces, allowing the applicant to exceed the maximum number, and that will read is granted, will not be contrary to the spirit and intent of the regulation. Stipulation number two being a request for a waiver of section 190-209 with respect to maximum driveway or curb cut width, um, and again, to allow the applicant to exceed uh, that maximum width, and that will read is granted, will not be contrary to the spirit and intent of the regulation. And stipulation number three being a request for a waiver from 190-279EE uh, requiring showing of existing conditions off-site. Um, that will read, uh, is granted, will not be contrary to the spirit and intent of the regulation. Stipulation number four to read as written in the staff report. Uh, stipulation number five in the staff report to be removed. And then stipulations uh, six through 10 to be renumbered accordingly and to read as written in the staff report. Okay, thank you, Mr. Varley. So we have that motion to approve with the uh, nine stipulations as indicated by Mr. Varley, um, or stated. Do we have a second? Second by Mr. Hirsch. Any further discussion by the board? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. That motion passes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so moving on with our uh, agenda here. Um, did anybody have a chance to take a look at the tentative agenda? Or, uh, give me a moment here. Uh, maybe I'll, 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 I'll hold on that for a minute. I'm going to bring up, so they, the next was a referral on the 2024 Capital Improvements Program from the Capital Improvements Committee. Um, everybody should have got a copy of that within their packets. Um, just some background on that. Obviously, I sat on that committee. Um, you know, the, it pretty much followed the same process that we used for the last number of years that I can remember. Um, with the exception that we did do some ranking of um, what we call out year um, capital projects. So, you know, normally we would just rank the um, 2024 projects. Um, this year, we, we did hear projects that were beyond 2024 and tried to apply some ranking to them in an effort to kind of just um, give the plan some more depth and to, um, you know, sometimes we see some of those out-year projects come in um, 
sort of quickly just because of some funding stream or something that that, that shows up <laughs> unexpectedly or whatever and um, you know having them ranked in the plan allows them to move more efficiently towards to ultimately the alder alderman so uh, I think that was a good improvement and seemed to work well so I'm definitely in favor of their ratings as they were put together and, and um, you know there was good input from the city departments on their presentations and the board members all um, were pretty actively engaged in it so um, I don't know Sam if there's anybody else who wants to say anything on the plan nothing really to add I think that was a fair summary okay so at, at this point uh, what we'll be looking for is a just a um, referral and generally it's either positive or negative um, I would recommend a positive <laughs> with um, you know, if you have any comments, you can add to it. Um, does anybody have any questions or want a discussion on the, the item? Yeah. Anybody want to make a motion on the I, I trust you. <laughs> I just have a comment. <laughs> sure, go ahead. I just want to, th I just yeah. want to thank uh, yeah. the, the committee again for, for the work. It's a, it's a lot of meetings and whatnot, and so I appreciate, appreciate the effort that, that goes into it. So th thanks, thanks to the committee. Yeah. Great. All right. Thanks, uh, Want to make a motion on Ms. Harper? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to make a positive recommendation uh, for the FY, um, FY 2024 Capital Improvements Program to the, um, the Board of Aldermen, correct? Yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. All right, so we have that motion by Ms. Harper for a uh, positive recommendation of the plan as presented. Um, do we have a second? Second by Mr. Hirsch. Any further discussion by the board? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That motion passes. Um, I'll jump now to uh, referral for the Board of Aldermen on proposed ordinance, amended ordinance, 023-043, um, amending the zoning map by rezoning portions of Veterans Memorial Parkway. Um, does someone want to present that? quickly here so sure thanks now, I don't know if you want to take them both together there does that make more sense uh, that would probably make sense yes, okay so I'll just read in that we also have a referral from the Board of Aldermen uh, proposed amended ordinance 023-044 establishing the Veterans Memorial Parkway redevelopment overlay district okay. <laughs> thank you and good evening mr. chair members of the board uh, my name is Brad Westgate I'm a lawyer with Weiner and Bennett 402 Amherst Street in Nashua. Uh, tonight with me is uh, Tom Zajac of Hainer Swanson, who's in the project engineer, uh, also <coughs> Bernie Plant of Blaylock Holdings LLC, and Michael Devon of Thorndike Development Corp, which is partnering with Blaylock. Uh, I represent uh, both. I'll try to be succinct, Mr. Chairman. Um, you'll recall back, in, back on March 9th, uh, Lloyd Geisinger of Thorndike and I presented to the board uh, an analysis of the three proposed zoning ordinance changes uh, that uh, would be presented to the Board of Aldermen uh, relative to underlying the tannery project. We did that in the context of a master concept plan, which was not actually passed on by this board, but gave a sense of the rationale behind the three ordinances that are before the Board of Aldermen. After that presentation on March 30, March 21, we appeared before the Aldermanic Planning and Economic Development Committee, essentially giving them the same presentation that you saw on March 9th. At that meeting before Aldermanic Planning and Economic Development, uh, there were a couple of uh, proposed amendments to these proposed ordinances, four in all. One of them pertains to Ordinance 02343. That's the ordinance that would rezone some of the adjacent property uh, to the tannery site into the R3 zone. The property being rezoned as a portion of the Broadway, bro the uh, uh, Veterans Memorial Parkway right of way, which would become a component of the project if all this becomes a reality. The Fimble Door Corporation parcel, and then two, a couple of very small pieces next to Huey Street and Intervale Street. 
The idea on that ordinance as we presented on March 9th is to get all that land mass into the RC zone, so that's the underlying residential district for the project. On March 21, before the Planning and Economic Development Committee, the other amendments were talked about. Um, these uh, had to do with Oath 2344, which is the text of the overlay district. Just to summarize these four amendments, the first one relative to O2343, the rezoning amendment, just technical corrections on meets and bounds description, legal description, uh, uh, errors that had to be fixed up and, um, and uh, made it, uh, into this amendment. The other three pertain to the 23-044, the textual amendment for the overlay district. Two of those three emanated from comments made by Alderman Jetty at that uh, meeting on March 21 before the Aldermanic Committee. We worked with uh, staff after the uh, ideas of, Mr. of Alderman Jetty were presented to generate the text for these two amendments. And the third amendment was one that we had proposed having to do with the timing of submission of applications before this board. I don't know if the, um, this board has received copies of these amended ordinances or not. I brought copies. We don't have to bog ourselves down very long, obviously, on it. Uh, yeah. And won't need to pass them out unless the board prefers. No, we have yeah. yep. okay, That's fine. Yep. So just to, again, just to summarize them. So one amendment on uh, Ordinance 2343 pertains to legal description corrections. The two amendments proposed by Alderman Jetty pertain to the permitted uses section of the uh, proposed Ordinance 2344. One had to do with clarifying the 20,000 square feet of commercial uh, non-residential use that might be made in the district. The basic idea of that clarification was to make it uh, certain that the 20,000 square foot was a cumulative number for the, all the land mass in the entire district, not segregated, uh, and perhaps allocable to one lot and then 20,000 square feet to another lot. The other ordinance uh, amendment proposed by Alderman Jetty had to do with accessory uses. The idea there was to not leave just the text, two words, accessory use, but tie it into the uh, land use code provision that permits accessory uses in the various zones and also make it clear that accessory uses are incidental and subordinate to principal uses, but they need not be on the same lot as uh, the principal use if they're part of the whole overall district and whole overall project. And the, the last amendment was the one that we had suggested. Previously, the proposed ordinance required that before we submitted applications to this board for subdivision, site plan, conditional use, or whatever, that the master development agreement and master concept plans had to be approved by the Board of Aldermen. The ordinance amendment that's before you tonight for recommendation would simply require that those master development agreement and master concept plan be submitted to the Board of Aldermen, but need not be approved as a gateway step to submit to this board. So if we submit to the Board of Aldermen those two documents, we can then submit to this board regular site plan subdivision applications. So we would uh, respectfully uh, submit that these amendments make sense. We thank staff for working with us to uh, get the text together to be able to have the Board of Aldermen refer to you tonight. Uh, this does go back to the Board of Aldermen on uh, Tuesday, uh, April 11th, this coming Tuesday. And again, we respectfully uh, suggest that you reaffirm your favorable recommendations from last month uh, relative to these two ordinances with these amendments. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, any questions from the Board for, uh, on these amendments? Thank you. Okay. I think we're all set then. All right. <clears throat> so any discussion on these? They seem like they're pretty straightforward. Uh, all, all the people. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I just want to say that they're not in my packet, but obviously I, I was on the Committee for Planning and yeah. Economic Development. So I've, I've said yes to this, I think, at least twice, um, including yeah. the amendments that, yeah. that yeah. happened. So um, yeah. I'm still for them. I think they make sense. And um, the whole thing is to start this ball rolling so we can get, get working on this. Uh, project that's going to take quite a, quite a many years to, to come to fruition. So uh, I, I would be favorable on it. Thank you. Great. Any other comments? All right. Anybody want to make a motion? I 
guess I can make a motion, Mr. Chair. Sure. Um, Yes. Um, So other business, um, I'd like to make a positive referral to the uh, Board of Aldermen uh, regarding the amended ordinance 0-23-043, amending zoning map by rezoning portions of the Veterans Memorial Parkway. All right. So we first up have this uh, positive Referral um, by Ms. Harper and this amendment for 023-043 as written and amended. Do we have a second on that? Second by Alderman Tebow. Any further discussion by the board? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, that motion passes. All right. Uh, Ms. Harper, do you want to make one regarding 023-044? Certainly, Mr. Chair. Um, in regards to ordinance, the amended or, amended ordinance 0-23-044, I'd like to make a positive recommendation um, as written. Okay. So we have that motion to make a positive referral for uh, 023-044. Do we have a second on that? Second by Mr. Hirsch. Any further discussion by the board? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. That motion passes. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Um, next up, the only other thing we had in the actual agenda was the tentative agenda. Did anybody find that? Yeah. I, I just had a yep. quick question for staff. So we've got this project that's been here for a little while, I think, at, at the Pheasant Lane Mall. Yeah. And I just, I, I feel like we've discussed this previously in terms of regional impact and and I think just want to confirm w what we determined was that because it's out out of state that the regional impact structure really doesn't apply that's correct that's right yeah okay, okay. <coughs> with, with that said as long as no one else has any comments I would make a motion that having reviewed the technical review agenda there are no proposals of regional impact all right so we have that motion by mr. Varley there are no uh, proposals of regional impact on the tentative agenda do we have a second on that? Second by Ms. Harper. Any further discussion by the board? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. That motion passes. Okay. Uh, do we have any other discussion items from staff or from the board at this time? All right. Hearing none, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Anybody? Ms. Harper? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Okay, so we have that motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. That motion passes. We're adjourned at 949.